tells you that this is allowed height and this is not allowed height. So, but if there was a population in which people can be six feet tall and six feet one inch tall, but not six feet half inch tall. So then the height is discrete. So same thing happens in the energy. So if you remember Bohr model, so that's quantization of energy level. I'll show some picture, which we have all read in school. All of us are familiar with semiconductor. You know that in semiconductor, there is a conduction band and balance band, only those energy is allowed. So in between, is forbidden. So energy is discrete. So that's quantum. So where was those? So this was used in developing all the semiconductor based products. So in principle, if you even if you understand want to understand the mobile phone you are using the computer from which I'm talking, they involve semiconductor and semiconductor requires quantum mechanics because classically everything is allowed. So if everything is allowed, every energy is allowed, there is no discrete energy level, no band gap, no diode, no IC, no computer, no mobile phone. So life in a complete classical world would have been very boring. Further, for entire communication, we use laser. And laser also require at least three level energy systems. So three discrete energy level. So laser, transistors, diode, all these, of course, not the vacuum tube kind of diodes, are implementation of second quantum, first quantum revolution. So now we are in verge of a situation where we'll use more subtle properties of quantum mechanics, and that will lead to second quantum revolution. So in the second quantum revolution, so in the left-hand top, there is an IBM quantum computer. And the similar thing you can see in the second picture in the top, where you can see a Google computer, you can identify from the photographs. So this is not actual part of the computer. So what you see in the outside, is called dilution refrigerator. So dilution refrigerator is used for cooling and that's the costliest part. It's not built in India. So there are many engineering challenges. So some engineers want to contribute in quantum computing. And instead of working really on computing, if somebody can make us cheap and innovative dilution refrigerator, there will be many users. We need Indian dilution refrigerator. So not only it's costly, the problem at the moment is that it takes a lot of time. So for example, I want to buy a couple of single, single photon detectors. So no Indian company so far really makes single photon detector. There is some claim from a Bangalore based company and the delivery time is about 40 weeks. So I have to wait for 40 weeks to get a single photon detector. Anyway, so this part is called the outside. What you see is for cooling that's called dilution refrigerator. And, but all qubit does not require this. So this is required for superconductivity based implementations and some other implementations. So most of the IBM computer, Google computer, the DOF computer works in very low temperature in milli Kelvin. Now in Stanford, some of my former students along with the Stanford professors are trying to work in four Kelvin and four Kelvin seems pretty high temperature compared to milli Kelvin. Now, how the computer is actual computer in the left in the middle, you can see that there is a cheap kind of thing. So that's the actual computer and that is placed inside. So the bigger part, which you see is only used for cooling. Now, when we were a student, when we were just getting exposed to this thing, then a friend used to do NMR based quantum computing. And what I saw that there is a molecule, the CH3Br. So this was her computer. So I'll talk about that. So this was in a test tube and then it was placed in NMR. So in the right hand side top, you can see that there is an NMR based quantum computer. So initially all the computing experiments were with NMR and people, this molecules were my computer and there is something called Lamar frequency. As many independent Lamar frequency, we believe that that many, more or less that's the maximum limit of qubits you can use. So this CH3Br is a three qubit quantum computer. So we used to joke that somebody came and asked our friend that, where is your quantum computer? And she told that, oh, I have was the, was the test tube and the quantum computer is washed out. Okay, now things are improving. So this molecules were three qubit quantum computer, five qubit quantum computer. And in NMR, we went up to 10, 12, but it was not scalable. It was not increasing beyond that. So in between, you can show ion trap. So these are different possibilities. And now there is a strong candidate called nitrogen vacancy center. 
in the middle between the molecule and the nmr implementation i can see that optical or photonic quantum computing so photonic nb center this works in room temperature so in the first day itself there were some generic comments that qubits require very low temperature that's true for transmon based quantum computers or superconductivity based quantum computers where the transmon qubits are used that's but that's not true in general and we ideally need a room temperature quantum computer but those are small and if you want to do computing with photon it's very difficult to keep them in one place but when you do cryptography you have to send it from one place to other place so photons are the only candidate so in us now it's a act and there is a national office and there are many initiatives in india also i'll come to them but we are supposed to talk about quantum cryptography so here is a bit of status update on quantum cryptography so what you see in the bottom in the left say left top so there are three names written this is a triangular pillar and how this is just to say that how important is quantum cryptography or in general cryptography is so this pillar is in close to one of our collaborators place means it's called poznan in poland so these are the three mathematicians who broke hitler's code and they were aware that hitler is going to invade poland so they sold this machine to or they gifted this machine to french russians copies of them and england and in then britain there is something called bartholdi park where alan turing made many copies and improved the machines and were able to decode hitler's messages so faith of the world where was much decided by the mathematicians just by breaking the code so the message is that hacking is not bad so this hacking helped civilizations from hitler the lower one is geneva brings quantum cryptography to internet voting there are so cryptography is not limited just by sending key and sending message there are other tasks where security is needed like internet voting so we work on voting auction sealed bid auction especially e commerce and many other things where cryptography has applications the right hand picture gives a sorry the most important one which was in much discussion now it is so this is from china to china to austria uh, satellite based quantum communication so how it is done we are come we will come back to that but that was the most important thing and that helped us to get fund also because india become interested after china successful quantum cryptography uh, experiment and it is expected that in couple of years we will also have because our, we have a strong satellite program we will also have satellite based quantum cryptography in india the two labs who are very strong in this are roman research institute in bangalore and physical research lab in ahmedabad so but where to establish the indian ground stations that's yet to be decided and drdo is also part of that discussion isro is also part of that discussion and soon we'll have our indian centers and probably so where is the challenges we'll come back to that in the top right we show a product that's called clavis 3 this is by id quantic and id quantic sells this this is a commercial product so there are several commercial product and we in our lab also there is something like a semi commercial product which we have developed in collaboration with cdot so clavis 3 is a much more mature commercial product where quantum cryptography is implemented so what you see in the lab lab setup so what we implement is called coherent one way protocol it's called cow so this is the setup and every time alice sends so in the top you can see alice and then there is in between there are some electronics especially fpga and this part is bob and in the bottom what you can see is a fiber based single photon detector so fiber phase single photon detectors are different from open space because in fiber we work in 15 15 nanometer where the loss in fiber is minimum or attenuation is minimum but the detectors are not good at that range so to have a good efficiency we need to work a lot and these detectors are pretty costly so this detector alone cost me 26 lakh and but open space detectors works in 800 nanometer and detector efficiency is pretty good in 800 nanometer but losses in open space is much more so this is right hand side is the door this is our quantum cryptography lab and so now i want to 
try to show you this practically. So it will be easier if you if you ping on my my photo for a while. So this is the lab. And this is what I was showing you. So this is Ali's Bob, etc. And now To increase the distance, the key size reduces. Voice break or yes, sir. Up key. Anirban, sir. Voice. Is there any problem? Ha, voice nahi aa rahi aapki. It disconnect ho them, sir, Shai, yeah, abhi bhi nahi aa rahe. Nah, now it is clear, sir. Okay, so, so we continue once. So secure quantum communication and computation at a glance. So just before that means in this lab, this setup, we can do up to 120 kilometer of quantum communications and when you increase the kilometer then the key size reduces and you can see sir, in the left hand side that ek minute inter interrupt kar rahi hu aapko ye aapne jo machine dikhai na isme alice bob aur ye jo kaise ho usme output fir aap kaise lete hain sir output kaise matlab receive karte hain no there is a fpga unit ha so in there are some electronics for alice some electronics for bob so this mm -hmm. output goes to two machines. So there are two computers in the lab, which are which are my means Alice's setup and Bob's setup. So when you put in fiber, so apparently Alice and Bob are separated by 40 kilometer or a 120 kilometer through this fiber, mm -hmm. but they are both the end of the fiber is one disk. So in the lab setup itself, means between one computer to other computer, there is a optical fiber of 40 kilometers. So one computer is from Alice, the other computer is Bob. And in Alice's computer, there are many provisions like here, what you can see in the left. So this is a screenshot from Alice's computer. So Alice can choose how many, what should, you can see that quantum beat error rate, uh, what is the final key rate. So these, these are the interfaces we have written. And then the main program is working in, in the FPGA setup. So here is the Alice's FPGA unit, here is a Bob's FPGA unit. So there okay, are many... Sir. Many things okay. for the engineers to do means like uh, we are not good in FPGA programming. So somebody wants to somebody wants to contribute in FPGA programming and especially error correction, privacy amplification, etc. Done on FPGA. Anyway, so quantum communication and computation at a glance. So there is a there is one for any cryptography. There is a principle called Kirchhoff's law, which tells that if the key is secure, then the communication is secure. So primary duty is to make a key, and key has to be random. But it's not all about simply making key. So there are many other facets. Like there is something called quantum secure direct communications where we don't generate a key. Rather, we send a message directly and direct secure communication. So that has two kinds of nature. One is called DSQC, one is called QSDC. And then there is a control version of that where a third party come. Usually Alice and Bob communicate and the third party controls. Then when third party allows, then only Alice and Bob will be able to communicate. There is something called quantum dialogue. So in quantum dialogue, Alice and Bob can talk to each other. So Alice can also send a secret message to Bob and Bob can also send a secret message to Alice. So it cannot be two different QSDC. It has to be in the same channel. So if I can do quantum dialogue, that means both of us can communicate and then one, one remains silent, just like now, both of us can communicate, but I'm talking and you are not talking. So then it will reduce to quantum secure direct communication. 
if you can do quantum secure direct communication then instead of sending a meaningful message you can send a key also a random number and then it will become qkd a key distribution but key is always required to be random now in the key which you have created if alice and bob both contributed equally and nobody can control the final bit value of the key at a particular position then it is called quantum key agreement so classically it is called key agreement but major applications is of qkd and if you can do if you can send the key in a secure manner then everything will be secure so the whole point is and then there are many other facets like somebody is talking about cryptography he will tell that well see that my cryptography is unconditionally secure but first alice and bob needs to know that they are talking with each other so authentication play a crucial role and most of the time we use classical authentication so if we can attack authentication so now there are several protocols of authentication so authentication is also interest now finally what is the advantage of quantum that whenever eve is there and eve try to do something it makes some changes and those are detectable changes eve is bound to make some changes so this changes are detected and i can detect the presence of eve but in reality the channel has some noise and some no change will happen because of those noise also so how do i distinguish between eve and noise so we must have a tolerable limit up to which we can tolerate the noise and then we have to do error correction privacy amplification and all these things and those routines are mostly classical routine those are need to be coded on my fpga board and any engineer who has interest can contribute to those means it's not essential that when you are working in this larger domain that you are working exactly on the quantum part only so many there are many components and there are challenges like we don't have any quantum memory repeaters are not there single photon source is not there single photon detectors are not very efficient so there are several several technological challenges and all these things lead to so this slide is a bit old and showing our mostly our works so communication has many many facets so sometimes it can be hierarchical that in the organizational setup that somebody may have higher power than the lower part and it may require that suppose you have a atom bomb and there is a key to open the atom bomb so if prime minister and president agree then they can open the key the, as a whole but if prime minister is missing then president has to take minister of defense state minister and maybe the chief of the army so more people will require to get the same same secret so that kind of hierarchical setup can also be done quantum auction can be done quantum voting can be done e-commerce can be done so there are many problems beyond key distributions and so and the graph theory plays a very crucial role in understanding that in which situation what thing will play okay so now we are gradually moving towards yes सर इसमें कंसेसनेस भी होगी क्या जैसे आपने ये बताया अगर मान लो की डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन है और की राइट की ही है तो कुछ उसके आगे भी मतलब कंसेसनेस अमंग मेंबर्स भी होगी अगर हम इसमें हायरकल बता रहे हैं अगर प्रेसिडेंट और प्राइम मिनिस्टर के बीच में प्राइम मिनिस्टर इज नॉट देयर तो डिफेंस है या सो दैट दैट्स द आईडिया 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 इज दैट सो देयर आर सम मींस मेनी थिंग्स आर इंस्पायर्ड फ्रॉम द क्लासिकल वर्ल्ड so just like if you when if you want to so classically to achieve security often we often we break the key into pieces so for example when you go and open a bank locker so your key alone cannot open the locker and manager cannot open the so there are pieces of the key with different people and now this hierarchy can be made that this the pieces of information in such a way that if the higher rank people are doing then two people can collaborate and open it if there if it is going in lower rank that the bank manager is absent then only one employee cannot open the locker means then three four keys will be required to open it that many people so just like you look at the jrt's checkbook so no institute checkbook has only single signatory authority so there are multiple signatory authority so when multiple people signs then only the you can withdraw the money so that's the reason means that's a way to avoid a decision which is may not be correct means to involve more people so that more people cannot be corrupt at the same time so this kind of strategy can be inbuilt in quantum structure also 
then some kind of organizational hierarchy that uh, and all these things are already in published works and some of these are originated from our group anyway so we come back to more basic so what is a qubit and how it is different from a bit so a bit is a two level system so if i any two level systems can be treated as a bit so for example in this room there is a light so if i say that switch on is one and switch off is zero so i can and how long one one so say one second so i keep the light on for three seconds then it will mean one 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 i keep it off for two seconds it will mean zero zero so now if you if you look it from a very distant places then gradually the intensity of the light will reduce and you have to amplify the signal so this is what is done by repeater so traditionally repeater was present even in the chinese great wall of china there were towers so the signal used to be repeated there so that's the traditional repeater but now and communication sense of communication or optical communication was there even the traffic light is optical communication so how the quantum thing is different so here we are showing a atom a nucleus and elect and the electron electron is in ground state i call it zero if it is in fast excited state i call it one so classically it can be either in zero or one so your finger up can be zero lower can be one my right hand can be one left hand can be zero so that's the way we send signal so you can see that this is this kind of in the bottom you see that somebody is showing some flag so this kind of signaling you have seen in airport and each of this has a meaning so something is a something is b and this is a traditional coding so how the quantum is different so in quantum it can be simultaneously in zero and one so this will be a cloud it's a cloud of probability when you do a measurement it will collapse either to excited state or to ground state but before you collapse this is present in both so that makes quantum different from classical so a superposition is allowed and on measurement so classically also there is superposition you all know who works on communication about maxwell's equations so maxwell's equations are linear differential equations solution of linear differential equations so if there are two solutions then a times the solution first solution plus b times the second solution is also a solution so superposition is allowed in the classical world that's why we see interference but quantum superposition collapses on measurement and that makes them very unique so we come back to the word quantum it means discreteness so here is a girl who asked for a 1267 ml of milk and the man is saying that sorry ma'am it's available only in multiple of 500 ml if you want to go to buy milk you will see and that's what is quantization so planck show for radiations there are light quanta comes in or energy comes in h nu to h nu etc and then einstein told that they go from one place to other place also in h nu to h nu and then come bohr model bohr showed that the atomic energy levels in hydrogen atoms are like this n is equal to 1 2 3 and we see certain spectral lines so these are all early days of quantum mechanics and then came schrodinger equations which is written below so these are all showing that in world there are things which are discrete and this discrete things then led to laser so this is fast quantum revolution what is we are showing in the left is a energy diagram of laser these are conduction band and valence band you know that in metal the superpose in semiconductor there is a small gap so all these things are manifestation of quantum nature or discrete nature and because of this semiconductor we can make ic's we can make <coughs> transistors we can make iphone laptop everything so we all are familiar with fast quantum revolution now i show something more many of you know wave particle duality so de broglie in any wavelength you give you cannot see something smaller than that now light has a wavelength of 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer means visible range so you cannot see many things in that you cannot see something smaller than that so that's why a microscope is called microscope that you cannot see so smaller than micrometer now if i want a smaller wavelength i have to use matter wave in between there are x ray and such things so in when we use a electron wavelength then i can see even a smaller thing and that leads to electron microscope so all these things ideas from quantum mechanics is used everywhere so cheap label designing if you are looking at a cheap you know so you work at this kind of range now 
in quantum mechanics, it's different from classical things. So mathematically, class there there is something called C number. C number is complex number, and there is operator. So what happens for complex number? We all know complex number J one, J two. J one times J two is always J two times J one. But for operator, it is not the case. So you all know that if you have two matrices, A B is not equal to B A. So in quantum mechanics, for every physical observable, so what is physical observable? Anything that you can measure is a physical observable. So, am I a physical observable? The answer is no. I am not a physical observable. Why? Because you cannot measure me. What you can do? You can measure my height. So, length is observable. You can measure my position. You can measure my momentum. So, all these things are observable. But I am, as a person, is not observable because you cannot measure me. So, anything that you can observe, quantum mechanically, there is an operator corresponding to that, and this operator operates on something called wave function and gives a eigenvalue equation so what is the eigenvalue equation so operator o operates on fx and gives a times fx so the function is back with a constant multiplier so this one is called eigenvalue a is called eigenvalue for this multiplier which is independent of x sometime it may contain x but this function is back so you see that if i take e to the power x and take ddx so ddx of e to the power x is e to the power x so then the eigenvalue is 1 ddx is operator and e to the power x my eigen function now there are some particular operator which is important so one is momentum operator is x and momentum in a uh, sorry position operator is x momentum in this direction px is minus i h bar del del x so this h bar is planck constant divided by 2 pi now what is its implementation you can easily see that x times ddx is not equal to ddx and x in the right so these two are different thing and when two operators do not commute means ab is not equal to ba i cannot measure them simultaneously with arbitrary accuracy this is a general statement of heisenberg's uncertainty principle so everybody knows that position and momentum cannot be measured but actually position and momentum in the same direction cannot be measured simultaneously with arbitrary accuracy so this leads to schrodinger equation hj is equal to ej so h is a Hamiltonian operator, or in the right hand side, you can write energy operator. Then this is the E is equal to I bar del del T is energy operator. So these are eigenvalue equations. So what is its implementations? So many people have told about wave functions. So wave functions is a packet of information. It contains all the information about the state, but it does not have a physical meaning. So mod j x square is the probability of finding the particle or the systems in position x, and So if I add total probability, I integrate it over from minus infinity plus infinity, I get one. So this is a single-valued function, means it must be finite everywhere. So we already mentioned that del x del p greater than equal to h. This is a gross Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So this is a simple quantum mechanics which is taught in engineering first year. Everybody, I means you may have forgotten, but this play a very crucial role in. in our in cryptography so it is easy to explain from here so there is some very important theorem which play a crucial role in quantum cryptography called no cloning theorem so what is no cloning theorem if i give you a qubit or a unknown quantum state you cannot make a copy how do we see that i cannot make a copy from here you see if i if it was allowed that i can make a copy then in one copy i would have measured position in the another copy i i will measure momentum and heisenberg uncertainty principle will be validated so what it tells that i cannot clone a unknown quantum state because if i can clone then i can measure position and momentum both or violet heisenberg uncertainty principle so what is its implications in cryptography when i send a quantum state from alice to bob if cannot make a copy and wait so if if eve has to do anything eve has to do at that moment classically if you have a key you put it in a very safe place you locked it somebody come enters make a copy and enters in your room and make a copy of the key book and left you don't have any trace somebody come to your office you have kept a question paper he took the question paper make a photocopy and replace it back in the right place in the right position you don't have any trace that your question paper have been copied quantum mechanically this cannot be done because if it was allowed then heisenberg uncertainty principle would have been valid 
So this leads to many other theorem of communication. So one such theorem, these are called no-go theorem. So one such theorem is called no broadcasting theorem. So what happens in broadcasting? In broadcasting, I have one message and I send it to many people. So you cannot do that quantum mechanically. If you have unknown state, you cannot send it to two receiver because then it will be copy and then you can violate Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So no cloning, no broadcasting, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, all these are no-go theorem. So initially people thought that these no-go theorems are rest putting restrictions on quantum mechanics. These are limitations of the physics because before that classically we are going for more and more accurate predictions. Now we realize with the advent of second quantum revolution, quantum cryptography, that this can be exploited to build cryptography, just like Eve is restricted. And then you remember that when I was defining qubit, I told you that a qubit can be in superposition of both zero and one. And when you do a measurement, it collapses to either to zero or to one. So well, so when it collapses either to zero or to one means that uh, now when I send a send a qubit from Alice to Bob. Eve cannot copy because of no cloning. So Eve wants to know what is I have sent, then you have to do a measurement. And whenever Eve will do a measurement, it will collapse to one of the possibilities and it will disturb the system. And that disturbance will carry a trace that Eve is there. So the difference is here. Classically, if even if there is a Eve, I don't know, it does not leave any trace. But here, we are not sending a message in the beginning. We are just trying to distribute a key and if I find out a trace of Eve, then I will not use that key. So I'll use the key only when I know that there was no Eve. So that's the notion of unconditional security. And it can be viewed in another way. Classically, how the security comes in cryptography. So I have a mathematically complicated problem in the background, be it factorization, be it discrete logarithm problem. So which I believe that my enemies or eavesdroppers cannot solve within the time frame up to which I want my information to be safe. So this is, there is an assumption, there is a condition. I'm putting a condition on the computational power of Eves. So whereas there is no such computational problem in the quantum cryptography. So quantum cryptography is secured by the laws of physics, laws of nature, not by the difficulty of a computational problem. So it does not matter whatever be the power of computer of my enemy, it will remain secure. But still there are possibilities of hacking it because the devices are imperfect. So our lab is actually meant for doing quantum hacking. So I'll come back to that, how hacking is possible, but let's do the basic first. So there is a notation. So from the first day, I am seeing that this notation, people are trying to convince you. So the whole thing is called bracket. So what you can see in the top. So the left-hand side is called bra and right-hand side is called kate. So this is Dirac's notation. So in this notation, so we write kate zero. So I read this as kate zero corresponds to a matrix one zero and k1 corresponds to a matrix 0, 1. So this is a convention. So if I want to write a qubit, which is a superposition of 0 and 1, so I write alpha 0, k0 plus alpha 1, k1. So if I, in matrix form, it becomes alpha 0, alpha 1. So this is a general qubit. So what is the probability? If I do a measurement using this 0 and 1 basis, and so then with mod alpha 0 square, I will get it 0. With mod 1 square, I will get it mod alpha one square, I'll get it one. So the measurement will collapse it. Now, there are many, this is not the only one basis. So zero and one, so zero and one, you can think that this is, this is zero horizontal, one is vertical, look at my finger, and 45 degree, 135 degree is my plus and minus. So this is one by root two, one, one. So these are plus minus is another basis. So how the measurement operator is written, measurement operator is written as like plus states measurement operator is kate xi, bra xi. So, and then I write kate zero bra zero, and this is like a dot product matrix multiplication. And we do, and we can see that M plus and M zero does not commute. M plus M zero is not equal to M zero M plus. So it's not equal to zero. So what it implies? So when I do a measurement in zero one basis or horizontal vertical basis, I'll not be able to do measurement in plus minus basis. So that's just remember that this is an application of Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and that will give me the security. Now, what is a quant, what is a gate? So every gate does a small computation. 
So quantum gate also does the similar thing. So there is a qubit, it maps an input state to another uh, well-defined output state. So if I have P5, this is a phase gate working on alpha beta, this is the qubit, and it does not change anything on zero. So zero remains zero and one becomes e to the power i phi one. So it introduces an additional phase. So this is the gate. How can you realize this gate? So in my lab, <coughs> I realized this gate with a glass plate, a very thin glass plate. It thickness defies in the pi. So it's just like if you have biology in your higher secondary, there were biology slides. So it's just like a slide, but much thinner than that. That can, I can put it in one path and introduce this gate. So quantum mechanics is I mean, quantum computing, initial visualizations means, of course, if you want to make a 50 qubit quantum computer, a scalable one, you have to go for superconductivity, but many things can be taught in the class. Many things can be demonstrated and there are cheaper devices. So now I continue. So this was the bit in the left and the down is qubit. So how to make the qubit, what I make in my lab, so there is a laser and sir, in post laser, sir, I use a particular sir. kind of attenuator. Hmm. So it's your Pellivalli PPT three is just before this. Yeah. So in that you explained about yeah, this. So this is like you are saying, firstly, it's not uh, vice versa. M plus and mod zero combination is not equal to mod zero comma mod plus. Right? No, there is no mod. mod. M plus is the operator. M plus, what I told you that uncertainty principle tells me that if yes. there are two operator A and B, if A B is equal to B A, yes. So when I write A comma B within a square bracket, that means A B minus B A. So A B minus B A is not equal to zero means A B is not equal to B A or M plus. Okay. So you have two matrices. A, A A times B matrix is not equal to B times A matrix. Then you will not be able to measure the corresponding physical operator simultaneously. Okay. And like, so AB is like uh, by this mathematical formulation, you have proved it like that AB uh -huh, means like, is not equal no, no, to B. Operator. What, what I, yes, 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 yes. So here the yes. operators are measurement operators. So if means in my lab, it is all polarization encoded. So if we have, if I make a qubit, uh, it's like that means if it is polarized in any other direction, say it's polarized in this way. So I'll write it like superposition of horizontal and vertical. So if I if I I can measure it horizontal vertical basis, yeah. I can measure in 45 degree, 135 degree basis, anything which is making 90 degree, but I cannot simultaneously measure in 45, 90 and for 45, 135 and 0, 90. That's not allowed. So I have to do it in one of them. So for example, this plus states, which I've written as one by root two, zero plus one by root two, one. Yes. So if I measure it in plus basis, plus minus basis, it will always be plus. But if I measure it in 0, 1 basis, with half probability, it will be 0. With half probability, it will be 1. So it will be changed. So if I have a 45 degree polarized photon, and I'm, I set the polarizer in 45 degree, or I measure it in that way, I'll see it 45 degree. But if I put my polarizer in such a way that it is in, it can measure in 0, 1, or horizontal vertical, so I'll see half of the time it is horizontal, half of the time is vertical. So it is changed. Okay. So this change will be detected when Alice and Bob will compare. Alice and Bob will be able to detect that this change has been made because of the intervention of if and if will be detected. And whenever I will detect the trace of if, I will not use it for future. Right, sir. Thank so you, sir. We are still in the elementary part. So this is a laser and we need a very weak laser. So I don't need a very costly laser. So in two of my pro mints, we have a couple of lasers in our lab, but they are cheap laser. So the costliest laser is in our collaborations with IIT Jodhpur, and we bought a laser called Femto Second Laser. And the laser itself costs something like 1.1 crore. But there are different purposes, but for simple purposes, means like the lasers in my lab cost two lakh on that order. So now post laser, there is a some particular kind of attenuator, which is called neutral density filter. So it reduces the intensity and we make a approximate single photon source. So one photon come and what is here is called beam splitter. So this kind of things, beam splitter you have seen in your BATEC lab also. So beam splitter, any, any partially reflecting glass plate is a beam splitter because it partially reflect, partially transmitted. Normally I take a 50-50 beam splitter. So half of the light goes in the reflected side, half of the goes in transmitted side. But now if I have only one photon, then what happens? 
So half the photon goes here and half the photon goes here. It does not happen. One photon does not break into two pieces. So quantum mechanically, what happens? It simultaneously remains present in zero and one, just like this electron is simultaneously in ground state and excited state. Now, if I put a detector, it will sometime collapse in one, sometime it will collapse in zero, sometime in the reflected path, sometime in the transmitted path. So this is the idea that there is a detector, sometime it clicks. So if it clicks, I call it zero. If it clicks, I'll call it one. So this is the simplest quantum cryptographic quantum device. So first you need a random number and then you need to check, change, send this random number to another party, share with somebody, and that's key distribution. So first we need, so what is the difference? Classically, you don't have any such random number. So classically, random numbers are divided into two parts. One is called pseudo random number, which you are, we generate in your computer by programming and such thing. And there is something called true random number. So in true random number, you involve a physical process. So I believe that many of the engineers are familiar with these things. So when you, when you take from a program, then it's a pseudo random number, they're faster. True random numbers are relatively slower, but you think that you are tossing a point. If I know how much force I have given, what is the air drag, everything, then I can predict what will be the outcome by solving Newton's equation. Now, they're not really, really random, but quantum mechanically, the randomness is coming from the intrinsic nature of the randomness present in the theory. No such randomness is classically there. So what is that randomness? That in collapse on measurement, if I collapse, measure this electron will be in zero or one, it will collapse randomly. If I, if these two photons are in place both, so if I measure, it will collapse to one or zero, and that can be made. So I have a setup in the lab in free space I can show you, but uh, it's difficult to set in camera. I'll try later, but I'll show you something else. So in the right-hand side, you show that quantities. So this is a product, which is the highest selling quantum product and of random number generator. And we'll come back to that. So that uses this kind of setup. So I can, show you that this is the quantities in my lab and how it looks. So I have a, I have the cheaper version. There is a, there is a costlier version, which is faster. Uh, and that has a, that is a cheap only, but this one looks like a, so this is the random number generator. It looks like your laptop charger. So I'll, I'll show a demo also. Uh, and there is a, there is a beam splitter, two detector, and now this is in the, in the cheap and it can it is available as a PCB card also. So, and this works in USB. There is a connector, I connect to USB and I can generate random number and show you. So this is used by banks to create OTP. OTPs will be more secure. This is used by lotteries, but you will be surprised to know that who is the largest buyer of it. The largest buyer of it is casinos. Casinos wants to protect them that with the best quality random numbers and most of these random number generators are purchased by casinos. So our lab is interested in building these random number generators. So we have some weak versions in the lab, but uh, okay. So we are continuing. These are the problems which you have done that particle in a box. Normally you have done in BTEC first year. So when this kind of problem solving Schrodinger equation was done in the lab. So what was shown is that there is only particle and box, nothing else. So I'm not solving this part, this problem. So this waves are showing the wave function. Now there is a harmonic oscillator. So when harmonic oscillator problem are solved in BTEC first year, we say that the energy is half H nu, three by two H nu, five by two H nu, etc. Now all the energy levels are, so now if I want to make a qubit out of that, then it's very difficult that if the zero is half h nu and the first one is one is in two h nu, three by two h nu, and the next one is five by two h nu, I give a photon of h nu, it can take it me from ground state to excited state, excited state to second one, third one. So I'll not be able to address it. So what we'll do, we'll make an harmonic oscillator. So an harmonic oscillator is shown below. So each qubit in a real quantum computer is an harmonic oscillator. But there is a difference that each of the qubits are different than harmonic oscillator so that I can address them separately. So in layman's language, their energy levels are different. Now I show the particle in a box. So you can see that the energy difference between N1 is equal in N2 is different from N3 and N4. And this goes in one by L square. So if I make it small, small, 
and uh, like something like a quantum dot so energy is n square h square by 8 ml square so the distance is increases then you will virtually suppose you are addressing with the ir photon so in the ir range you have only two energy level so it will reduce to a two level quantum systems that's my qubit but i need the qubit such a way that each of the qubits can be addressed separately so i need separate anharmonic oscillator and they are put in many places so what we show in the right hand side is a ibm's quantum computer which is a five qubit quantum computer so what stops me to make it generalize it so this is showing a unitary operator as quantum gate so I'll, let's avoid this mathematics this is a solution of schrodinger equation and this these are small matrices in the notations like not gate all of us are familiar so not gate can be written in this way because we have already defined that gate zero is one zero a column matrix so this two by two matrix will take it one zero two zero one and zero one to one zero so this is a not gate similarly i have other Pauli matrices so this sigma y i sigma y which is the off diagonal with minus one it changes one to minus one and keep zero to zero so if i give it for alpha zero beta one it will become alpha zero minus beta one so not will make alpha alpha zero beta one into alpha one plus beta zero so similarly the jet gate which does both the bit flip done by x and fetch flip done by y so these are actually uh, interaction a particular hamiltonian for a particular time so we when we make the circuits and each of these gate actually does a small computation now we want to visualize a quantum gate so look at this picture so you have a zero level and one level so there is a laser which takes it from zero to one and the same laser takes back to one to zero then that laser is not gate because it's changing zero to one one to zero so the notion of gates are no more like your traditional semiconductor gates it can be realized in many different ways so there is a hadamard gate which is very useful so hadamard gate is takes zero to one by root to zero plus one so that's my plus states and one to minus states one by root to zero minus one now we apply a couple of gates then it's a circuit and each gate does a computation circuit does a little more difficult computation so how you visualize that each gate does a computation if you give x not gate computes a function f of x equal to x bar it always gives you take x as input and gives you x bar as output so that's a computation then there is a very important gate it's called c not gate so control not gate takes 0, 0. So this is a two qubit gate. It takes 0, 0 to 0, 0, 0, 1 to 0, 1, 1, 0. So whenever the first qubit or the control is in one, then the target is split. So target, if it was 0, it becomes 1. So 1, 0 goes to 1, 1, 1, 1 goes to 1, 0. And that this is the corresponding matrix. So these are used and these gates are inbuilt in your quantities. If you want to apply IBM quantum computer, you can write a small program in quantize or you can draw so I'm more or less done with the introduction. It's little more than half of the lecture. I thought that I'll solve, do it in half the lecture. So basic idea of quantum mechanics is that for every physical observable, there is an operator. Sometimes the operators commute, then I can measure the corresponding physical observable simultaneously. Otherwise, I cannot. Then using this, there are four layers of things, quantum communication, quantum computing, quantum metrology, and quantum materials. So it's not like that. And these are interdependent. So unless material scientists give us good quantum materials, we will not be able to develop things. Quantum communication is quite ready. Quantum cryptography is almost commercial products. But unless quantum computing evolve and classical cryptography face a real threat, the market will not develop because people will go for classical cryptographic solutions or at most post quantum cryptographic solutions. And so and quantum metrology is about the development of sensors. So in India, there are several initiatives and in all the initiatives, we have divided the things into these four verticals. And so quantum metrology is about the sensors like developing quantum radar. Uh, and very soon there will be a handheld, handheld magnetometer means MRI device, which will look like a metal detector. It is expected. There will be many quantum sensors. And Quantum communication, computations about computers and building quantum computers and many talks you have heard. Quantum communications, we are talking here. So how all this thing started? Because my title has a word called history. So I'm starting from history. So in 1970, Stephen Weisner had this idea of quantum 
communication for the first time and he thought of a banknote which cannot be forged so he thought that he will put some qubits in the banknote so the instead of the number and if anybody wants to forge he has to do measurement and the qubits will change but it's not expected that you will have qubits in the banknote and you will put the banknote in wallet and wallet in your pocket and the qubits will remain same but the idea of cryptography was inherently there and he sent this paper to a ITPL journal and it was immediately rejected because the jargon was not familiar with the engineers. So Stephen Weisner and Charles Bennett was friends. They were classmates in undergraduate and in postgraduate, they were in different city and they were Jew and there was no synagogue in the city where Stephen Weisner used to live and he used to come to Bennett's place and he explained Bennett and Bennett took this note. So you can see the right hand side, a handwritten note. This is obtained from Charlie. So Charles Bennett, the father figure of quantum cryptography. And this, you look at the date, this is of 1970. And Bennett become interested and, and Bennett tried to convince many people about it and he was not successful. Then there was a conference happening in Potro Rico. It's a beach city and Brassard was swimming. And Bennett, who was not known to Brassard, he knew the name, but not the person, swim there and inside the ocean, he started telling Brassard, you know, one of my friend has devised some scheme for quantum cryptography and this like that, et cetera. And they started talking. And by the time they returned back to the shore in the beach, they had the first idea of BB84, but it, it was difficult to publish. And it was actually published in 1984. This is a conference version of 82. So you see that the time gap, the people took much time to accept it and it all happened. So now I come to the Indian link to this. So what was the Indian link? So then Brassard found it very difficult to publish it. At that time, a conference was happening in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and Bijay Vargaba, who was the coordinator, so these are from Brassard's note, memory. So Bijay Vargaba was in charge of a special session on coding and information theory for yet another IEEE conference, which took place in Bangalore in December 84. And he invited me to give a talk. And this talk was published as BB84 protocol. So the further protocol of quantum cryptography was in India. And then Indian initiative started from coming from 1990s. So Arun Pati, who works in Allahabad, HRI contributed in the beginning. Some of the Indians who works abroad. So I told you about an experiment where the CH3BR was used. That was done by Kavita and Anil Kumar in the middle, which you show. Simon come up with a very nice algorithm. He's in math science. And Guru Prashadkar, with others in ISI, uh, and they published very nice papers in early 90s. So theory developed in India. And Indians outside developed several nice, nice algorithms. So in this picture, I show Love and Umesh. So Umesh Bhajirani was working in US as well as Love. So Love is, I mean, many, many people, many seniors in our institute knows Love personally, uh, except those means like me means who, who learn, who know him from quantum cryptography aspects, but uh, he was born and brought up in IIT Roorkee. And then he did PhD, um, BTEC from BTEC from IIT Delhi. So, and he used to live in the quarter quarters of Roorkee University. So uh, he knows many people means in JP systems. Anyway, so Love gave a very wonderful algorithm called Love's algorithm, which is used for unsorted database search and it can do it in the square root of N. So these were, but then Stephen Swesner papers of 70 published in 83, then Bennett's paper come in 1984. Then Eckhart come with a protocol where six states are involved in 1991. Then immediately Bennett show another paper that neither four state, which was required in BB84, nor six state is required. Even two state can do. So, so far people were showing that <clears throat> only key distributions and using the idea that there are there are two bases and you cannot measure them simultaneously in this basis. But then, so these were involving non-orthogonal states. Then in Goldenberg and Bedman come up with the idea that even you can do with orthogonal states. So things keep on going on and later people show that we can do direct communications and many such things. So I avoid this historical note. So with this background, let's be ready and we go to quantum land. So we work on this quantum land. So here I'm showing a uh, not cryptography, another kind of quantum communication. It's called teleportation. 
So what happens in teleportation? The information about the state is lost from one end and it's created in the other end. So, so far we can do some photonic state teleportation, etc. So this is the right hand side. What we show is Analander physics. This is the journal where Einstein published all his phenomenal paper of 1905. And in 2021 October issue, cover was from our lab. So, and on teleportation, that's what is shown here. And okay, anyway, so this is what is showing here that a man come to New York and want to go to New Delhi and he is almost transferred immediately, but you can see that his nose and ear has been changed. So it was a teleportation station. And he asked that what is the reason? And they show that because of noise, we cannot reach the unique fidelity. So what we are showing here. So when in class, you have been taught a very simple quantum mechanics or what we teach to our BTEC students, there is only system. But in reality, it's not only system, there is a bath. Means everything apart from the system is bath or or reservoir. So system interacts with the bath and there is an interaction Hamiltonian, there is a reservoir. So this H, HS is present system, this is interaction, this is the reservoir. And unintentional changes happen. So this is a way we study. I'll, I'll skip those things, how cross operators, etc., works, but we, we do a lot of work on noise. So the noise is the largest problem. That's the problem that I cannot make scalable quantum computer. Before we proceed further and we get into the quantum land, we are waiting at the immigration office and we need to understand certain things. So I believe that my computer science colleagues are familiar with the complexity classes and such things, but there may be some people or some PhD students who are from different backgrounds. So I just take some time. So suppose, I'll, first statement is algorithms have nothing to do with computer. So to elaborate that, let's take, one, two, three, one, plus two, three, one, two. So what is algorithm? Algorithm is a systematic procedure to solve a computational problem. So if I'm doing one, two, three, one, plus two, three, one, two, so I write the numbers and then I write the next numbers below that and digit wise, the decimal place wise, I add them. So four digit number plus four digit number takes me four step. So n digit number plus n digit number will take me n step. So any, any problem which takes n steps are of the same level of complexity. But now you are doing 12 multiplied by 34. You see that first you have to multiply 12 by four. So two times multiplication, then three will be two times. So then you have to do addition. So you can easily see that even the two digit number multiplied by two digit number involves more steps. So the more steps, the more complexity. So multiplication is more complex than division, than addition. So when a problem can, I, and we assume that each step takes one unit of time. So if n steps are involved, then we say that complexity is n. If root over n is better, if somebody can do it in log n, it is even better. So if it can be done in polynomial time, polynomial number of steps, we say that it is computationally doable or easy. If it cannot be reduced, I know I don't know an algorithm which can be reduced in polynomial, it's called NP or non-reducible to polynomial. And there is a subclass which is called NP hard and certain things we don't know. We don't know whether P is equal to NP. We don't know, now I don't know a problem solution in polynomial time, whether it means that there will not be any other new algorithm. So there are many things in computer science which are unknown and which I believe. So in this complexity class or complexity Q, there are some other classes. So one such class is called BPP. So the quantum class corresponding to P is called Q. So BPP is the class where you can solve the problem with the bounded error. Now, what happens if you cannot solve it? If you can solve it, you are doing it probabilistically. So probabilistically, sometime you will be able to solve, sometime you will fail, but the failure probability is limited. You can narrow it down to delta, a very small number. So that's called BPP. BPP. There is a corresponding quantum class called BQP. So far, every algorithm that we have solved is in BQP. So now the belief is that BQP is a subset of NP. What does it mean? No. It's a proper subset of NP that there are problems in NP, which is not in BQP. Any, any comment? Uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. Sir, you said that we can, uh, like, uh, if we are not able to solve, we would like to solve it in a bounded error uh, boundary. Like, uh, it's like a fixed No, no, it's a probabilistic, probabilistic, probably we'll use a, instead of a deterministic method, I will use a probabilistic method. So with okay. some probability, so there are several algorithms that there is a certain failure probability. And so that will, will fix that probability can be reduced. 
will fix that failure bound boundary also that error can lie only in this boundary yes right? yes error is bounded error is bounded to a very small number yeah uh, so, so if we, uh, so failure uh, probability we is bounded but as we had we know that we will get approximate solution and we are giving for approximate no no i'm not talking about np hard problem i'm talking about a class of problem which belong to bpp class so bpp is bounded these are probabilistic algorithm so there is a failure probability but failure probability is bounded so certain okay. problems we can solve in this approach so they are called bpp and corresponding quantum class is bqp so at the moment the belief is that quantum algorithms can solve only problems in bqp class and bqp is a subclass of np so it's a proper subset so what does it mean it means that there are problems in np which is outside bqp so some of the np problem is in bpp or bqp but there are problems in np which is outside means which cannot be solved by this approach that probabilistic algorithm which with a bounded failure probability so if so that is, is the case so i can i can pick up a so what pardon? is bqp please explain bqp bqp, BQP is quantum means when you are using quantum resources and this bqp is the quantum counterpart of bpp okay bpp bpp is the means you can solve it in polynomial time provided you are doing a probabilistic allowing a probabilistic approach sometime the protocol will succeed sometime it will fail but the failure probability is bounded okay yeah. so so bqp is a similar quantum protocol so quantum protocols means when you are using quantum resources you can do it faster but so far all the algorithm whatever problem they have solved is in bqp class Mm -hmm. but it does not mean that it will not be able to solve a problem outside bqp class but now people believe that there can be problems in np which is outside bqp and if i such put a pick such a problem and develop my quantum cryptography then that will be safe even when a scalable quantum computer is built so those are called post quantum cryptography so many people are working in post quantum cryptography especially in lattice based cryptography and it makes sense to work immediately ship to post quantum cryptography but still this will be conditionally secure not unconditionally secure okay no in the in this world i mean the classical world there is a computational problem in the back and if we increase the key size then the security for what is the time for which you want to make it secure that will increase so this ideas came from 76 and 78 so not much before the quantum cryptography even stephen wisner paper was before rsa and diffie hellman but there are quantum algorithms like peter sors algorithm which does the factorization problem in polynomial time so factorization reduces to a bqp problem and it so if so what is the problem so then why still we are using rsa rsa discrete logarithm problems means diffie hellman are mixture of that elliptic curve rsa elliptic curve diffie hellman all these are unsafe at the moment if i have a scalable quantum computer but we don't have a scalable quantum computer because of noise so noise is a problem that's what i was stressing so unless there is a scalable comp quantum computer and classical cryptography is really in crisis people will not buy quantum cryptographic solution in large and the market will not increase and unless the market increases the price will remain high so now the source algorithm is used for time factorization so what we did when ibm quantum computer was built we had factorized successfully using a variant of sor we wrote a different version and after a lot of effort one of my phd student was able to solve prove that 35 is equal to 7 into 5 so this is just an example where we stand but now people have solved 90 lakh plus factorization using a small quantum computer and things are moving so this is the neutral density filter post laser after a beam splitter i create qubit in this way and then i put detectors and the detector clicks either 0 or 1 so i have already shown you such a detector so in when i was a student i had to believe this so somebody tell me that it will be clicked either on 0 or 1 i have to believe this but you don't need to believe it uh, you can test it now you have this kit you have ibm quantum computer you can go to a ibm quantum computer and just write a hadamard gate and i tell you that the hadamard gate tells 0 to 1 by root to 0 plus 1 by root to 1 so if you put a put a measurement here the measurement will either lead to 1 so this is one time measurement or 0 but when you do multiple times say 8192 times you see that gradually these bars are getting equal 
So that means in 50% probability, it is going to zero, 50% probability, it is going to one. So now you don't need to believe me that it collapses randomly. You can check it. You have access you can, with your mobile phone also, you can access quantum IBM quantum experience and use a free quantum computer. So this is the device which I have shown you. So these are the random binary output. And then there are several NIST tests which you can ask your students to do. And this device is not very costly. It's about thousand, thousand euro, but the taxation is very high. So if time permit, I'll, I'll show you the random numbers. So I just, uh, we have done NIST test. So what is the utility? So now the DDA can tell that we are using, using quantum random number generator. So there is no biasness. Uh, state lottery, Sikkim state lottery can say that we our lottery is secure. Parliament can say that we are doing quantum voting. UNESCO can claim that we are using quantum veto. Uh, say casinos can, of Macau can claim that your money is safe. There is an equal chance that we, you win whatever number you, you bet for using QRNG. QRNG is everywhere. But this is up to this was random number generators. Now the random numbers has to be some, go from one place to other place. So what we are depicting in this picture, a lot of things. So the top picture is showing BB84 protocol. So in BB84 protocol, what we do, I create sequence of photons prepared in horizontally polarized, vertically polarized, or 45 degree, 135 degree polarized. So this is horizontally, vertically, and so on. So these are the polarizer you kept and accordingly the unpolarized light is going polarized and going through the channel. Now, Bob is doing a measurement. So Bob is doing a measurement either in horizontal vertical polarization. So when you are using this basis, so if, if it is horizontal or vertical, it will pass exactly and the same thing will be revealed. But if it is in 45 degree, 135 degree with half probability, it will appear zero, half probability, it will appear one. So same is true for the diagonal polarization. So this one we call, the lower one we call computational, the top one we call diagonal. So now say Alice has sent 1000 such qubits and Bob has randomly measured them in horizontal vertical or, or 45 degree, 135 degree, that is diagonal basis. So half of the time their basis, basis will match. And in those cases, their result should, final result should match. So first what happened that after this thousand qubits have reached, Bob discloses that which qubit he has measured in which basis, not the result. So Alice will match that in which cases their basis matches. So he will ask Bob to drop rest of the 500. So now we are left with 5,500 qubits, which all of them are prepared and measured in the same basis. So their final value should match. Now what will Bob do? Bob will disclose the outcome of measurement of 250 of them and they will compare. So if there is no if, then all these 250 must match. So some of them may mismatch because of the, so this will be dropped. So what we have shown here that Alice's bit sequence 1001, et cetera, Bob choose a measurement basis. So when the measurement basis matches, they kept it. And all the cases where measurement basis mismatch, there are arrows, so we dropped it. So after this steps, half of them bit value is disclosed. If there is no if, bit value should match. What happens if there is a if? So you consider that I have prepared it in 45 degree. And if half of the time, if will also choose correct basis. So the if will not be traced. So if is 40, if is also measuring in diagonal basis, so 45 will remain 45 and no change. But in case if has chosen 0, 1 basis, so with half probability 45 has become 0, half probability 45 has become 1. But Bob has kept only those cases where he's an if Alice's basis match. So he is measuring in diagonal basis. And now the zero will half of the time will be plus, half of the time it will be minus. So half of those cases in which half of, means total, suppose Eve has measured 100 qubits. Out of 100 qubits, 50 qubits he has chosen correct basis. So they will not lead to any wrong result. Out of the 50, half, of, half will give incorrect result. So total 25 qubit will give incorrect result or 25% of the results will be incorrect or one fourth will be incorrect. So when Alice and Bob are comparing, they will get a trace that E is present and then they will not use this key. But if there is a 4% deviation, 5% deviation, so Eve has decided that I'll not leave so much trace, I'll selectively attack. <laughs> so then suppose we find out that 10% of the qubits bid values may remain with Eve. Then, I want to increase my privacy. So what I'll do, 
I choose randomly two bit values, say Alice and Bob, say one and 13, and I do a XOR operation. So the probability of the first one is with if is one by 10. The 37th is with if, if is one by 10. So probability that both of them are there is one by 100. So multiple times I do and I can increase the privacy. So there are several other things and privacy amplification can happen. So this is the background of BB84 protocol. Now you look at the satellites, the Chinese satellites made much news and these are the satellites of different countries, placed many places. So how this thing work? So you see that there is a satellite over say ground station one, this may be in Delhi and the other is in, when the satellite goes over Calcutta, we create another key by say BB84 and key two and then satellite discloses key, key two XOR key one and the Station two has key two. So he does key two, XOR, key two, XOR, key one. So key two is open and he left with key one, which was with the station one. And then use this key, the satellite has no more any role. So satellite is only doing the key distribution. Often people say that quantum satellite, there is no quantum satellite. It's a conventional small satellites. These are nano satellites and they carry a payload. So what they carry is called payload and payload is capable of doing this communication. So, and then, we do this video conference or whatever it is, but the key generation rate is slower. So this, this is not really one-time pad and nobody really uses one-time pad. So we, we repeat the key or we collect the key and then do the communication. But this is how, how the satellite communication works. So we are interested in our own satellites, different countries of satellites. So we need to design payload and take, take up. This is how things are done in the lab. So we saw that there are lasers, these are laser diodes. So something is giving horizontally polarized, something is giving vertically polarized, anti-diagonal, diagonal, and we mix up. And these are the modulator. And then this side is belong to bomb. So there is something called polarizing beam splitter. So what does polarizing beam splitter do? So a polarizing beam splitter is one which allows horizontal light to pass and vertical light will reflect. So if the light comes in the left-hand side, where is my mouse? My mouse, so you see that the horizontal light will polarize and this will detect, vertical light will reflect and this detector will detect. So this setup, sorry, the low, lower setup can detect horizontal vertical because PBS will allow vertical photon to come here in the reflected part, horizontal to transmitted part. Now, here is a, the, there is a yellowish one. So this is a phase shifter. So this shifts the phase by 45 degree. So your 45 degree now will become 90 degree and 135 degree will become zero degree. So 135 will now become horizontal and anti-diagonal will come here and 45 degree will become vertical. So this side, the top side is doing measurement in plus minus basis. This side is doing measurement in zero one basis. And here is a beam splitter. So with half probability descending here, half probability that is random. So what I'm saying that Bob randomly measures in zero one and plus minus basis. So how it looks in my lab, so this is the picture of lab, but these are drawn in some software, but I can show you the real lab also. This is called something measurement device independent QKD. So this is the best one. The best QKD, which is possible at the moment is device independent QKD, but that requires very efficient detectors, which is not available. So the best possible thing which we can do that, so the detectors imperfections, optics imperfections can be used for hacking. So here, it is free from measurement devices imperfections. So part of the imperfections cannot, so even if the somebody give me an incorrect thing, so this is showing the satellite thing. So some of you may know Chitra. Chitra was our PhD student. Obishek was in our postdoc. So they, this is the Chinese lab and this is the satellite. So the real communication is happening. So I'll skip a few things. So faculty who want to go back and there do something similar in their lab, so this is the equipment which is available from Thor Lab, and this can that this you can purchase. So there is a source, there is a polarizer. So polarizers rotate it in different angles, 45 degree, zero degree, 90 degree, etc. And then there is an analyzer. So this setup belongs to Eve, and this is Bob. So this this setup, this is a test kind of setup. You cannot do research, but you, it is possible to show students and train them. And the problem is that in this setup, we need actually zero photon. So this is called laser power meter. I don't see the laser power meter immediately in my left hand side. So these are from my lab. So the bench, which you can see in the back, this is called a honeycomb table or optical bench. So this is a huge table. It's 700 kg or something like that. And it's floating. So there are air pressures. So if sometime 
the colleagues means who are in JIT want to visit, we can show that this, this, this is actually floating. So even if earthquake happens, my optics will not scatter. But the problem is that there are multiple photons, so huge photon numbers in this. So BB84 protocol I explained. So how I do it in the lab? So there is a laser, it comes and we send the polarizer and then in another polarizer, so this is Bob site. And we check the similar way that when the basis is same, I'm getting the same result or not. So I'll skip these things. So this, this, these are the setup in the lab. So we have an Alice, so the, he has a small laser and this is the free space thing, of course. This is the polarizer, which I can rotate in 45 degree, 135 degree, et cetera. Ideally, this should be automated. So some engineering colleague can help me in doing better robotics to make it automated. And then here also the analyzer is not automated. We do it manually, but you can take data and check that it's working. So this kind of setup cost about three lakh. And there is another thing called Elitzar Redman bomb testing setup from Thor lab, which we also have a copy. And when you add them, you can make multiple. So these are the real lab observations, Alice's basis, Bob's basis. So you can play and do many things. Now, can the classical user have some access? The answer is yes. So if the class, but if you are, so now there is a big questions about doing blind quantum computing. I, I guess I'll not tell all these things. So I just tell you that there is something called semi-quantum that some of the users can be classical and still the security can be given. So instead of telling more, I'll, I'll show you some a bit of the lab. And finally, I tell you that there is some hacking possibilities and we can we just exploit the device imperfection. And that's the that's what we do in this lab. So this is showing the that beam splitter is a function of wavelength that whether it does 50-50 does beam splitting or not, I can change the wavelength, I can change the time, etc. And here are some major Indian initiatives. So we have two projects from something called Quest, Quantum Enhanced Science and Technology. It's part of ICPS, Interdisciplinary Cyber Physical Space. And there are many new things like now CDOT who collaborates with us means like JRT has a move with CDOT for co-development of the product. So CDOT has a quantum communication lab. We have a contact lab in here and we work together to develop new things. In CDAC, the initiatives are led by Dr. Anandita Banerjee, who was our former PhD students there. They are also involved in developing things under MIT. So several ministries are involved, not only DST. And Quest was a big mission, means there are two Quest. One is from Department of Space and one is from DST. Now, in the last few years, means we have developed something called National Mission on Quantum Technology and Applications, which is still in cabinet. And that's the 8,000 crore thing. So many, many things are, so there are a lot of money in this field. There are many new companies. So here we show some of the startups. So, and many, many things are achieved in PRL in other labs so, and DRDO. And now we had a project called QMAN. So in QMAN project, it was possible to show in the real optical fiber, some 200 kilometer point of communications. But the problem is that you need a dark fiber. So you cannot put repeaters because there is no quantum repeater. So if there is a joint in the fiber that cannot be used for quantum communications. So we need dark fiber. And Indian dream is to develop indigenous product and become exporter of the quantum technologies instead of importer. But at the moment we have to buy almost everything in my lab, only the optical bench is Indian, everything else is, else is purchased from abroad and it takes a lot of time. So engineers have a lot to contribute and in the development. So where do we stand? So now we have SNSPD single, so that's the best single photon detector, which a quantum cryptography shop can sell now. So single photon nanoware, superconducting, so superconducting nanoware single photon detector, quantities we have shown in the beginning, avalanche photodiodes, payloads for satellite. But what we don't have is a photon number detector, which does not destroy the polarizations. Quantum repeater is not available. So which, so later on, these things will be available, the technology will develop, but certain things will not be able to do. Perfect cloning will not be allowed because that's a stop by quantum mechanics, quantum broadening, super broadcasting will not be allowed. So things are moving. And here is Alice and Bob. We show a cartoon just um, in the pressure of time. So don't send personal message to my papa or someone else may eavesdrop. 
So this Bob is saying that I'm not afraid because of Pegasus and your father as the channel is quantum secure. So quantum secure channel will give the ultimate security. Post quantum is still conditionally secure. And these are a couple of books. The textbook from our group is in the right hand side, CRC Press that's taught in many places. And this is a SPI book which discuss about the optics used in the lab and some other books which you can refer. And I'll, I'll stop here and show part of the lab. So. Any queries? Participants, uh, any two queries? Minutes, two, more, two, two more minutes for showing the lab means how, how it really, really works. So. so this one will this one is connected to a shop software and uh, we can get the numbers but if time permits then only will show but here is so you may have problem in listening me now So this 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 is to because we work in the single photon regime we need to make it dark so this black curtain is because of that and then in the post the black curtain what you can see Hello, sir. Uh -huh. signal ka show ho gaya kya? Uh, no, no, I was I was carrying so that it I got this. And so this is more or less means and Mukta kitna time they sakto Can I have two, three minutes to show the random number? Ha, 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 sir, they So what you see is in the screen is is actually the random number generator. Means so in the random number generator now you can see that This is called easy quantities. The physical random number generator I have already shown you that this is the interface and you can say create integer number and now there is a scalar data. So if I choose between zero and one and one zero four twenty four qubit, so this will be a binary, binary thing. So I just press Apogee, random data successfully generated and it's saving some file. So I just make it display. So you see that this is my, this is the random numbers I generated and you can copy to clipboard, you can do NIST test, whatever you want. It's as big you want, you can do it. So you can, you can change the size and everything. So this is, this is a quantum random number generator quantum random numbers. And if somebody wants to use random numbers for some other want me to generate the number and we can we can supply them. 
So now it's in decimal. So you can see that it's a decimal random number. So you can change many things and create the best possible password, best possible OTPs using these devices, but that's only a part of that. So I'll, I'll stop and any questions means on my talk, on previous talks, anything you can ask. Participants, please ask. Sir, this one question. What did you use to do the NIST test? It's not NIST, NIST. Uh, NIST, sir. Not S, S, this is S, NIST. So you have these random numbers, means once, and on, not only this, means the keys are also supposed to be random. So when you take my main device's key, output keys, and then uh, NIST tests are available, means these are, you don't need to write your own coding. So you just need to download the test from NIST sites and a simple two, three lines Python mod for the rest of the thing. So this is a, op it's a standard test, but beyond that, there are certain tests like die hard test and there is some test means die hard requires a longer key the size size must be longer the random number should be longer for die hard test otherwise it does not give good results and the drdo has its own test mul lion so we implemented mul lion also and all these things actually pass all all possible tests any other query if to start for the test what uh, you will refer like you would like to go from the uh, fundamental knowledge so there are a couple of books which are easy to follow the main book is nielsen chuang nielsen chuang is like our bible it's just like core man but to begin with the books good books are there is a phillips and kai and mac mohan and my book okay and one thing i want to mention means that first ever course on quantum computing or quantum information was taught to ICT MTech program of JIT. So we taught the first ever course on, there was a MTech program called information and communication technology and their second year students were offered a course in as long back as in 2002. So that was first, I mean, that's recognized the first, first First Indian, Indian, any Indian university taught the first course on quantum computing was to our ICTM tech students, but that course, the program does not exist anymore. It's, uh, uh, are you not planning to make it in a form of MOOC or any other online? Uh, so the book, course? book I have shown means there is a, there is a book, CRC Press book and which no, is taught no, in many, MOOC many course, years. Are your own MOOC course uh, in which you give idea from the basic knowledge of quantum not the MOOC, but there is a book standard textbook yeah, which, which i wrote and that's that's yeah. used used in many places means like that's a textbook in iit dharwar that's a textbook in isa kolkata okay. Thank you, sir. i have a general question sir hmm. sir in case of when we compare classical computers with quantum computers we see in case of a qubit we can represent many bits using a single qubit but basically a single qubit represent infinite positions when we talk about superpositions so why we say that only finite numbers or finite bits are representing using a qubit why we can't say that we can represent infinite numbers or we can say uh, all numbers can be represented using a single qubit why we need 160 qubits or 100 qubits or uh, that many qubits to represent different numbers why not a single qubit can be used for all these things no no a single qubit is a superposition single qubit is a two level system a two level quantum system so when you measure and extract you can you can uh, your measurement will yield only one of the two possibilities so the corresponding complex number space so you your classical computer also works in hilbert space quantum computer also works in hilbert space so this Hilbert space is C2. So if you the problem arises that if you have go for two qubit, then it is C2 into C2 is a C4. N qubit is C to the power n. So I n qubit can handle what is equivalent to your two to the power n bit system. So now if n goes hundred, the number will be so big that it cannot handle with any classical computer. 
So you need some 100, 150 qubits, and then further there is something called error correction. So error correction for it's just like classical error correction, majority voting technique. But at least for one qubit, error corrected qubit, you need five corresponding qubit. So if I need to do 100 qubit computations, I'll require an error free. I need need a five qubit quantum computer, 500 qubit quantum computer, which is pretty big. What I, we have at the moment is 50 qubit quantum computer, and that also has many architectural restrictions like qubit number four may not be able to talk with qubit number 47 and when i want it to talk then i have to implement a big circuit and that every gate has some noise so when you look at a particular gate it gives a fidelity of 99 percent or something but when you have 100 such gates each of them introducing one percent error this is a substantial error and we don't want to the other problem is that quantum states are not stable so they are very fragile so we make a state and that's why we work in such a low temperature and it is there for something like one one millisecond and each gate requires one microsecond then only you can do thousand operations before it stops working but this this lucid idea is that each qubit contains uh, infinite information it's infinite information is true but it's not infinitely different possibilities which you can check so when finally to take your result you have to measure and it will lead to one of the two possibilities means when it's a qubit Sir, I have one more question. Hmm. Uh, uh, sometimes we say that we can execute uh, our program in quantum computing or use qubits on IBM platform. And sometimes I uh, read or heard that only first minute of our computation is free. After that, it's quite costly to execute your program or IBM. So what is true? Only first? First minute of computation is free. One minute, only one minute. No, 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 no. Nothing like that means. And no, you cannot do any computation which works for one minute or more. You see, means yeah. IBM, IBM is giving certain things for free, and then for free part you have some coin. So you are using your coins. Yeah. So that depends. But nothing, none of your computation actually goes for because what I said to you that the state which they prepared, the transmon qubits, they last for some couple of milliseconds and each computation requires microseconds so something like thousand gates you can implement but ibm allows you to do 100 and 100 gates or 150 gates so and none of this will take more than 150 microseconds so you are not what you the task which you give does not take minutes means they are not talking about one of the tasks it, they are saying that for one task, one minute is there, but you can execute any number of tasks. I use the IBM you know, as much as possible. Means yeah, we we have run means like for this is a statistical thing. So for certain certain papers, we have run ten million times IBM IBM programs also. Thank you. Sir. So you have to make a multi. I mean, if you really want to do something, make multiple IDs yeah, and request for a next level of user access but no none of your single program takes more than one so whatever you are telling is some some misguided statements there is no nothing like that so when you run a particular circuit a particular circuit will never take a minute it will take few microseconds only and then it is giving you a token so every day you can run a small number of tasks so if you want to run more number of tasks make multiple logins any other query Participants, any other query? So there is no query, sir. Uh, thanks for the wonderful session. Uh, like uh, concepts, uh, like we get more concepts get clear. So thanks. Uh, thank you once again, sir. Thank you so much, sir. So just one but, statement, uh, said, probably uh, I asked, understand the next question properly that finally, once you do measurement, this is no more quantum. The ultimate numbers are classical. This is a zeros or one. So when you have a sequence of zeros and ones, you just apply conventional computer science. Means you have a you have a laptop and in or desktop and you have apply an NIST test. It's no more qubit. After measurement, these are bits. Actually, sir, what happens is that we computer science. So apply pe wo jada wo dhyan dete hai. So wo jo concept hai na, wo thoda sa deviate ho jate hai. 
participants please don't go away we will have a session after 10 minutes we'll have a 10 minute break then we have a uh, rohit sir Rohit sir, is it okay that we can have a ten-minute break? Ah uh, yes, definitely.
Rohit sir. Oh, yes, ma'am. एक बार पीपीटी अपनी टेस्ट कर लीजिए शेयर कर आई डू नॉट हैव द एक्सेस टू शेयर द स्क्रीन ओके Uh, the screen is visible right yeah and everything i write is visible yes yes okay mm -hmm. do i need to start right now or? yes uh, so i uh, let me introduce you to the participants uh, okay welcome i welcome you all the day seven session 2 at the summer school for quantum computing and its application uh, for the session 2 we are having mr rohit mr rohit did his btech in engineering physics from delhi technical university delhi currently he is working at qlab software limited he is a part of quantum digital simulation group before joining qlab he has worked with tech mahindra makers lab pune and keros technology private limited hyderabad he was the winner of the community choice award for the hackathon project quantum orchestra so i welcome you mr rohit uh, over to you sir thank you ma'am uh, you don't need to call me sir i am just a, a btech graduate so yes today uh, i'll be given a tutorial on uh, hhl algorithm so hhl algorithm is basically a quantum algorithm which is used to solve the linear set of equations so it is a quantum algorithm and it uh, is able to give uh, results uh, exponentially faster uh, it was given by haru hasid uh, hasidim and lloyd so these were the three physicists or uh, three scientist or theoretical or uh, algorithms who gave the algorithms so basically in a linear equation uh, we we try we try to solve this particular equation so where a is the matrix x is a vector and b is also a vector so it's like uh, we all know we have a set of equation like x minus y equal to 2 and x plus y equal to 1 so we can represent it uh, either solve it by add in or subtract in these two equation together or by the matrix representation so in matrix representation we will have a matrix 1 minus 1 plus 1 which is the coefficients of x and y in both the equations and uh, the variables a vector for the variables x and uh, these constant a vector for the constants so in order to solve this equation in this in this case uh okay so in this case uh, this is a this is x vector and this is our b vector so in order to solve this equation uh, we need to find the solution that is our x vector so we take this equation and find take the inverse of a and we get this so basically what we want to do is have a quantum register 
which is able to give us this state when we input uh, uh, initial state B. So if you have this state, we want to operate this operation and we want to get the final state as X vector in our quantum register. So there are certain uh, rules or requirements for it to be uh, possible for it to apply on quantum uh, circuit that A must be an Hermitian matrix. Must be an Hermitian matrix. So if it is not, then what we can we can do is that A is not uh, Sorry, permission. Then, then we can change our a and rewrite it as uh, this zero, a, a dagger and zero. So this makes it a Hermitian now, and now we can solve it on a, a quantum computer. So uh, let's say we have this equation x vector is equal to a inverse b vector we uh, let us assume that a has eigen vectors uh, some eigen vectors which is u1 u2 and so on until u to the power u n right so we can write a as the outer product and sorry before that uh, each eigen vector has a corresponding eigen value so this is basic math uh, let's denote it by lambda up till lambda n so we can denote a or write a in terms of the outer product of these uh, eigen vectors multiplied by the each of them multiplied by the coefficient Basically, this is known as the spectral decomposition, and it, it somewhat looks like this. Ui, outer product of Ui. From uh, i equal to n0 to capital N minus 1. Okay. So, um, now we know, so basically, we want A inverse. So, A inverse would be i equal to 0 to n minus 1 lambda i inverse e and ui outer product okay so now we need to represent b we can actually represent b in terms of ui why because uh, ui forms an orthonormal basis Since they are forming an orthonormal basis, it is possible for us to write uh, B in terms of U, which can be, which is given as summation over all the bases, uh, J equal to zero to N minus one, uh, BJ and UJ, right? Hmm. Now, uh, since we need A inverse, A inverse multiplied by B, we are going to multiply this equation and this equation and finally we'll be getting something like this a inverse b is equal to summation from i equal to 0 to n minus 1 summation from j equal to 0 to n minus 1 and uh, this part we write this part first, which is lambda i inverse ui, then followed by this part, which is bj uj. Okay, so now I can write this uh, bj over here. It's a scalar value, so I'll just write it over here. Let's go here. bj. Now, if you see this part of the uh, equation, which is nothing but ui outer pro uh, dot product or inner product of these, uh, or basically norm of the base or orth two orthonormal bases. So it has to be equal to delta ij. Now, 
this is this just means that when i is equal to j what will happen is that uh, this will turn out to be 1 but when i is not equal to j this will turn out to be 0 so only the terms where uh, we have i is equal to j will survive others will vanish to 0 so finally we what we will be getting is a inverse b vector is actually equal to i summation over i n minus 1 uh bj lambda uh, sorry it will be i only bi lambda i inverse and ui this term either becomes 0 or 1 so we don't need to write that so finally what we want is that this form of the we want to have a quantum algorithm which is the hhl algorithm to give us this uh, this state which we can call x vector so this state uh, is the is our solution now uh, going to the hhl algorithm this was some basics that we need to know going to the hhl algorithm uh, let me draw the circuit for the algorithm that uh, which will let, let, which will allow us to know the steps that are involved in the algorithm so first thing we need is one ancilla qubit ancilla qubit and then uh, we need clock registers which is denoted as 0 0 dot 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 uh, this is these are clock register and we need n number of clock register actually so these are n number of clock registers then we need to prepare a, a set of register which is in the state b right uh, this these can be this actually this state can be obtained by using some state preparation method like amplitude encoding or basis encoding or there are many methods so this is the state register that we have and this is nothing but our b that we want this this part which we want to evolve to reach over here so uh, the first part of the algorithm is to uh, have a superposition of all the clock registers and then apply uh, then apply a rotation the phase kickbacks basically these are called phase kickbacks unitary controlled unitary operations which are known as phase kickbacks so i write it like this this is u uh, this is applied u to the power so what uh, it was a uh, ah, to u to the power n minus 1 this is applied u to the power and there are many then u to the power 1 u to the power u u to the power 2 to the power 0 so this is the second part this is known as the phase kickback and then uh, we have to have a quantum fourier transform that is inverse quantum fourier transform over here so we apply uh, iqft inverse quantum fourier transform okay so then there we have a third step of so this this whole part is only a first step first step of algorithm now we have to perform control rotation on the ancilla qubits some control rotation r y using r y with certain parameters and so this is a this is actually quite a big circuit but uh, it will depend on the number of qubits and the size of the matrix that we are solving so after that this is this is one part this is part two oh, sorry this is part one this is step second this is the second step
Now the third step is to perform measurement on the ancilla qubit. So if the measurement is uh, comes out to be uh, state one, then we continue. But if the measurement comes out to be state, if, if the measurement comes out to be state zero in the ancilla bit, then we reiterate. We restart the algorithm. So after, and let's say we got one. Then next thing is to do is uh, actually apply the inverse of everything that we applied in the first part. So this first part, uh, which is combined with, with uh, when you include Hadamard gate and these unitary rotations and inverse quantum Fourier transform is actually known as uh, quantum phase estimation. So basically now you have to apply inverse of quantum phase estimation. And then after that, perform the measurement on our state register. And this will yield our X vector, which is our solution vector. So let's start with the first step, which is QP. And within QP, we know there are three steps. First is Hadamard or the superposition of all the uh, clock registers. Then is the uh, phase kickbacks, multiple phase kickbacks. And then we have our QFT, inverse QFT, quantum Fourier transform. So uh, initially we have this particular state, ancilla qubit, followed by some n number of clock qubits. And this third register is our state register. So we are applying the Hadamard in the first step, we are going to apply Hadamard or on each of these uh, clock register, right? So when we do this, we are going to get a state, which is uh, like this, uh, the coefficient of two to the power n by two will come out and I'll just write inside each cube, superposition of each qubit one. Second qubit will also be in this same state until n number of qubits. So after clock register, this will, be, this will be the state of clock register. Clock register. And we have our state register, okay. So after the clock register, after we have applied the Hadamard, what we need to do is basically apply phase kickbacks. So I'll give give us short idea of what phase kickback is. So I'll take it as a let's small let's just move deviate away from the topic right now. We need to understand what phase kickback is. So we'll understand phase kickback and come back to this particular state again. Okay. So whenever we have a unitary operator, we know that. Uh, its eigenvalues can be given as uh, exponential of iota phi in terms of certain phase. So let's say we have u, u is our unitary uh, matrix, and we are op operating it on b. Let's say uh, we are operating b is our state that we had initially, right? The clock, uh, the state over here in the circuit. So let's say u, we have a unitary operation such that uh, B is the eigen. As in some eigenvalues of B vector and B again. And now what I'm going to do is just right. Take the inverse of everything over here and we are going to get B. B. Now, if I multiply these two or sandwich them together, what I'm going to get is U dagger U b and over here oh sorry over here i should be getting not the kid but bra so what i'll get is b b conjugate b and this so we know that uh, unitary operations operator has a property that if they are hermitian then this is equal to identity so over here this part will become this part will vanish so we'll it will become one and we'll have v, v, uh, b as outer product uh, sorry 
the norm of b over here and this is this part is the scalar so we can just bring it out and we can write it as a model square of b and again we'll have norm of b so norm of b with b itself is one and this is also one so what we are left with is uh, b square is equal to one this implies that the solution b which is the eigenvalue to u is given as iota phi so we can so basically this is a solution this is the eigenvalue of uh, vector b so where this phi is known as the phase of the eigenvalue what we call it phase of eigenvalue okay so when we move on to the next part let's say uh, we have a have this particular circuit small circuit uh, hadamard gate over here and b vector we, we have implemented the b vector and we are applying a unitary u on this a control rotation of u right so what will be the final state over here at the end at this end so let's say we start we had zero and we had b then we applied the hadamard on the on this particular part so we are going to get it in the superposition state one under root of two and b over here and now we are applying a controlled uh, u rotation right u so control u rotation means that uh, whenever this is the control qubit is zero uh, nothing will happen but whenever the control is one uh, we will be able to operate this on you so before i'll just write it like this one uh, b so i've done nothing but bring brought b inside the vector okay now i'm going to apply control u that we have so since the control is zero in this part of the state nothing will happen to b so it remains as it is right and uh, since this part has control to be one we'll be applying the u operator on b u times b under root of 2 and we know what u u times b is it's just b times b and we know the value of b we can write it as iota phi b so what we are going to get finally is 0 plus uh, e to the power iota phi 1 by root 2 and this is b okay so i've taken out b as i've taken b common and i've applied u and i got the phase over here so basically we can see that we are able to bring the phase or the eigenvalue of b vector onto some other qubit right so this is known as phase kickback basically we are kicking back the phase of this particular vector onto some other some another qubit so that's why it is known as phase kickback so next step next thing is to learn a particular identity that will be useful let's say zero is here and there is hadamard over here there is uh, our b state and when this time we are going to apply u 2 to the power j times multiple times control u and so on basically uh, dot 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 until some n number of so this is u u to the power j we can like equivalently we can just write it as or define it as some hadamard and u this as u to the power j on to the b sorry will be b B vector. Okay. okay, so what will be the final state in this particular this particular part of the circuit? Let's see. We we start with the zero and b 
then we have the hadamard on applied on the first qubit which is which gives us this state square root 2 and lamp and b then we apply u control u 2 to the power j times right what is going to happen is that uh, we'll have a uh, multiple phases over here instead of one phase that we have we will have multiple phases applied uh, so let so let's see we have zero first so nothing will happen to b so we'll write it as zero and b and we have one over here so we'll be applying u to the power j times so one applied to u to the power j times which gives us times b right Okay, two two. Now uh, I'll just bring this. Now uh, this is like we are applying u. We can just write this part as u, u, u applied to b. So this part will give us e to the power of phi b, and then we have more u's over here. So. So when this is multiplied by this, we are going to get iota phi, iota phi b. So basically, we are going to get uh, this final state b plus uh, one e to the power iota phi times two to the power j uh, and b over here. This is root two. Okay. So this is the state that that we are going to get. Rohit. Yes, ma'am. अगर in terms of हम इसकी बात करेंगे graph की, तो हमें कैसा graph मिलेगा इस case में? In terms of graph, uh, I didn't हाँ. understand. Like uh, ये question है, ये like ये question एक previous talk में भी आया था. Suppose we are having a multiple gates. उन्होंने कुछ और गेट लिया था सी नॉट गेट लिया था उन्होंने सी नॉट गेट सो वी आर हैविंग मोर देन वन और अप टू एन जैसे आपने ये यू गेट अप टू जे तक लिए हैं तो आपको ये क्वेश्चन मिल रही है सो इस पे अगर मान लो एक जनरल टर्म में हम लेमैन की टर्म में हम बात करें तो हमारा क्या इफेक्ट पड़ेगा इसे एक है 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 गेट और एक ये यू के हमने एन नंबर ऑफ गेट्स ले लिए सो दिस इज अ जनरल इफेक्ट लाइक एन नंबर ऑफ लाइक ओके सो वी आर अप्लाइंग एन यू एन नंबर ऑफ टाइम्स राइट सो वी आर एबल टू टेक बैक द फेज ऑफ बी बैक टू दिस ऑन सम अनदर अनदर क्यूबिट राइट सो वी आर एबल टू ट्रांसफर द वैल्यू ऑफ 1 ऑन टू सम अनदर अनदर क्यूबिट सो दिस इज Face. This is called face kickback, actually. Okay. So, like, in terms of block sphere, if you are trying to say, then there will be a certain the state will be uh, in the. Let's say I cannot. I'm not able to draw the block sphere, but this is a superposition state, and we'll have it on a x-axis, and also there will be a certain phase to the one. So there will be a certain rotation uh, by uh, with respect to your z-axis. so okay. it will not be exactly in the hadamard state but with the phase and b will be represented separately on another block sphere because it is a separate uh, qubit right so each qubit uh, gets one block sphere okay okay thank you mm -hmm. okay so following this we have this state now uh so we can see that if we are applying phase kickback what is the take away basically if you are applying phase kick back uh u to the power j times what we are getting is a new state is this iota 2 to the power j 1 times the vector so this is the basic uh, take back for the phase kick back uh also we can write this e to the power iota phi as e to the power 2 pi iota times maybe theta or i'll reuse phi over here i'll just so this is just different notation we can write it like this also 
so if we get back to our previous uh, previous state which was uh, we had applied hardmart gate to we had applied hardmart gate to our initial state that was ancilla over here and then we got a uh, superposition of all the states Uh, then we had our vector B. Sorry, this will be this will not be A. This is B. Okay, so what we are going to do is apply the multiple rotation. Let's say we have this uh, in the I had shown in the circuit. This was a clock register, and we have n number of clock registers. Or uh, sorry, not clock registers, but n number of qubits in the clock register. We apply control rotation one at a time from each of them, like this, and so on. This is how it be. This so first we apply it to n minus one time. So what will happen? Uh, this. Uh, the phase from here will get back to this qubit, and if we are applying this one uh, two to the power n minus two times, the phase of this will go back to this qubit, and so on. If la in last, we'll be applying it two to the power zero times. That is only one time, and the phase of this will go to this part of the register one time. So what we are going to end up is. This is our uh, this particular qubit. This particular qubit. So we are applying u only one time. So in this case, this state would become zero plus uh, e to the power two phi. Sorry, two pi r times yes, two pi. Two pi iota phi times two to the power. Sorry, there will be no. There will be only one in this case. One. In the second qubit, which is over here, let this is the second qubit, and in the second qubit we are applying it. Uh, okay. Uh, let me just make one more over here. So this will be u to the power two. That is, we are applying it two times. So which will be over here? This superposition will be there. So we are going to get zero plus. E to the power two pi iota phi times two times so one. Then uh, so on and on. In the last, in, this is the uh, second. This is the second last. And over here we are applying it n to the power two my n minus two times. So what we are going to get is uh, is the phase applied two to the power n minus two. So we will get zero plus e to the power two pi iota phi uh, two to the power n minus two state one. And again, so in last we are going to apply it this many times two to the power n minus one times. So what we are going the last qubit which is in the superposition state is going to get the phase to be two pi iota phi. Times two to the power n minus one, and this will become one, and so on. Okay, so this will be the final state that we are going to get after applying the multiple control rotation on on this part of the circuit. Right, we are not dealing with ancilla right now. It will uh, happen in the second step of the algorithm. So uh, I'll write it neatly. Uh, Down below, I'll write neatly. What we are, uh, what we'll end up with is zero. This is the ancilla state, and over here we'll have the coefficient n by two for the superposition, and then we have first state, which is a superposition, which is somewhat like this. Then we have second state, which in which will be our phi eta. Two, one, and so on till zero plus 
2 pi iota phi 2 to the power n minus 1 1 and finally we have our b vector which is already there as it is so we can actually write this in a very compact manner like in terms of certain summation so how we can do that i'll show by taking a very small example in let's say we had only two clock register only these two states so what will happen is that uh, we can write this as zero plus i'll just write it over here zero two pi iota phi to the power two to the power one and one over here right and zero plus uh, e to the power two pi iota phi two square one right and we have had a mod at three two so basically this is a small small thing so let's say we have two qubits only we are case taking a very special case only for two qubits for two clock registers so Hadamard has been applied and then uh, we apply control u on to b this will be two to the power n minus one n is equal to two so n minus one would become one and so we are going to get two to the power one and over here n minus one would become zero and so we are going to get two to the power zero which is basically our one so this will give us this particular state so the clock registers will be in this particular state currently right now now i'll just simplify this uh, by multiplying each of them so what i'm going to get is this uh, zero zero will give us zero zero and this will be this one uh, sorry this will be two this will be one so uh, this will sorry this will actually be uh, zero and this will be one so this uh, okay sorry 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 this will be zero this will be one really sorry confused okay so uh, what we are going to get is zero zero and uh, zero one which has a coefficient two pi iota phi two to the power one which is two and zero one also we are going to get one zero which will have the coefficient as two pi iota phi two to the power uh, zero one and one zero and we are going to get one one uh, which will have the coefficient as e to the power 2 pi iota phi 2 to the power 0 plus 2 to the power 1 1 1 okay so this we are going to get if you see carefully we have a general we have some pattern over here since the coefficient of 0 0 is 1 we can just write it as 2 pi iota phi uh, 0 so if you see in decimal in binary form this is this is 0 0 which when you convert from binary to decimal uh, is zero and the coefficient uh, the the term, the factor that we are multiplying with pi is also zero over here and this when translated to decimal will give you one and this two to the power zero is also one and this is also two and this is also two and when you add these two you are going to get three and when you translate this one one into decimal you're going to get three so basically we can just write it as summation let's say k equal to zero to three e to the power two pi iota phi times k and k over here so it will translate if you open the summation you are going to get this and you have one by two factor over here okay so you can just further uh, generalize if we had instead of like what I have taken here are only two qubits instead you have n number of qubits you can just generalize it uh, such that your summation would be k equal to zero 
to n minus one and e to the power two pi iota phi k k. So this is what uh, so this is what we have in our case in in this part of the state after applying the phase kickbacks. So we can just write this state uh, as a, a very in a very small format in a two two to the power n and sila bit a and we have summation over. Uh, we are writing the clock register in, in short notation so n minus one e to the power two pi iota phi uh, times k and this is k and we have our b register okay so this is what we have got uh, this is our state after we have applied the second step phase kickbacks we have applied phase kickbacks and we have got this state. So now the third step is actually to apply inverse quantum Fourier transform. So before understand, before just applying the inverse quantum Fourier transform, we must know what a quantum Fourier transform is. So let's say you have a quantum Fourier transform and let's say we have some qubit J which uh, on which we are applying QFT. So after applying Q, QFT on J, we are going to get a new state, which is summation from K equal to zero to N minus one, e to the power uh, two pi iota J K by N and K over here. So this is QFT. This like there are certain operations you apply on this qubit or set of bits and you get this final state. So similarly, when you apply inverse quantum Fourier transform on, on this state, what you're going to get is one by root n k equal to zero to n minus one e to the power minus two pi iota j. The only difference is that there will be a negative exponent. Okay. This will be a difference. This is what's going to happen. Right. So what we have now, we want to apply inverse quantum Fourier transform on this K on our state, right? So we have Ancilla base and also one thing to note that we'll be applying this QFT inverse QFT on clock registers. That is this one only on the clock registers. So we had, uh, so let's say we are applying inverse quantum Fourier transform on our state that we have applying on this register k equal to zero to n minus one uh, e to the power two pi iota phi, just phi, right? Yes, phi times k, phi times k and k vector. And we have B register over here. So uh, this is actually equal to, since uh, this this coefficient is a scalar, we can just bring it out and bring KFT, QF, QFT inside. Summation, uh, I'm not writing the indices because this is now known and this will be reputation. QFT applied to vector k and b so uh, we know we applied it on uh, we have applied it on j and we got this so we can just use this identity or this uh, identity on this vector and we can rewrite it as some and we have ancilla we have summation over e to the power 2 pi iota phi times k and on applying this, we are what we are going to get. So there was two to the power n by two as well. What we are going to get is uh, two to the power n by two over here as well. And summation of y equal to zero to n minus one e to the power minus two pi iota 
k and y by n times y vector and we have p over so this is what we are going to get after applying the inverse quantum Fourier transform and we can take this coefficient and over here we are to simplify the expression we get 2 to the power n and sila and uh, we can just write this summation let's say i'm writing it over here one is from k from which starts from k the other one summa other summation is from for y equal to 0 to n minus 1 and we can just put together these exponents together we are going to get phi uh, k it, k will be common phi minus y by n times y and this and we are just going to have b now there are certain like this part of the circuit actually simplifies to very something very simple n times y so i'll show how uh, let's say you are opening this summation of y y equal to zero started from y and you're you're opening first summation so what will happen is that there will be two cases first case when y by n is not equal to zero second case is when phi minus y by n is equal to zero so that means phi is equal to y by n and what will happen in that case all the terms which uh, the exponent will have this would become zero and therefore you have e to the power zero and this will be one right so all the terms with uh, this condition being satisfied the summation would become k equal to zero to n minus one and uh, you're going to get vector y over here and so basically e to the power zero times vector y which is one so you're going to write it like this y plus y plus so on until n minus one times so basically you're going to get n times y vector in this case but what about the terms where this is not equal to zero i'll bring it over here where phi is not equal to y by n actually uh, what happens for these terms where phi phi is not equal to y by n is that everything vanishes vanish to zero so let's say uh, what we are going to have let's say i'll, I'll call this as p uh, phi n minus y by n as p by n right for just simplification just for the sake of writing it easily so we have opened the y summation and finally what we have got this so this is uh, 2 pi iota um, it is k right k uh, this this thing is over here n phi minus y by n which you can just write it as p by n times uh, and this was it right yes yes so this is what we are going to get now if you look carefully you will find that this is nothing but solution to nth root of uh, unity so let's say we have x cube equal to one so we all know from our basic basic mathemat mathematics is that it has three solutions which is which we call one omega and omega square and these three solution has a property when you sum them up omega plus omega square you will obtain zero okay and this is the property that we are going to use so this is a special case now the general case is x to the power n is equal to one this gives us n number of solutions which is one omega omega square up to omega to the power n minus one right and it also holds this property which is one plus omega plus omega square plus so on up till omega n minus one is equal to zero so also okay so omega is actually in terms when you solve this solve for omega you will get in terms of complex uh, numbers you are going you can write it as 2 pi iota some 
by out of some number by uh, n. Uh, um, sorry, some number k by n. This is omega. So I'll just write put a plug in the value of omega over here and write it like right and write the sum. So this is one can be written as zero. So two pi at uh, zero by n. Uh, sorry, k zero by n. Then omega is as it is two pi k by n. Omega square will be written as uh, e to the power two pi iota k times uh, two by n, and so on up till uh, e to the power k uh, n minus one by n will be zero. It's going to be zero. Uh, so I'll just write it in notation term. This is equal to uh, some number p equal to zero to n minus one. e to the power two pi iota k p by n, and this is supposed to be equal to zero. And also, this is supposed to be equal to what we have for the case where phi is not equal to n. This part. So this is van will vanish zero. So the only thing that we are left with is n. This n for the cases. Phi minus y by n is equal to zero. So this actually, in terms of physics, is known as a constructive interference, and this thing is known as destructive interference. This is just the mathematics, and in physics, physics when you're dealing with interference or studying interference, then you uh, use these identities to get the destructive and in, uh, constructive interference. So. Uh, Ha! Huh, this n is nothing but two to the power n. So what will happen to this state? Uh, what we are going to get over here? I'll just rewrite it. Uh, this will become one by two to the power n, and n sigma bit a, and this thing becomes uh, nothing but simple n times uh, your y times the b vector. And this n actually cancels out with this, and what we get is finally this zero a y and b. And also, uh, since we are using this condition, phi is equal to uh, phi minus y by n is equal to zero, we can also write that y is equal to n times phi. Right, so okay, so we can replace y as n times y. And b. Right, so this is the final state that we get after applying our Hadamard. Phase kickback PKs, or I call it PKs. Then inverse quantum Fourier transform. Right, this is the final state that we are getting. Okay, so before that, uh, we can uh, write before moving on to the next step, which is control rotation on Encilla. We can uh, perform some changes. Actually, this n phi that we have over here is a uh, is Not an integer. So this is actually a problem to us, since we know that within the uh, ket notation everything is represented in zero or one basis. So basically, if, let's say it is any number, and it will be written as zero one 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 zero zero any number. But using this in the ket notation, we won't be able to tell. Which is the decimal point? Where is the decimal point? Since it is not an integer, there has there has to be a decimal point, but we won't be able to know which uh, decimal, which uh, like which part of this has the decimal point, or where is the position of decimal point. So that creates a trouble, a problem. So, uh, in order to uh, like deal with it. 
uh, what I am going to do is uh, there's something called rescaling. We can do that. Uh, so if you remember, we had applied uh, unitary operations U on B to give us uh, this B and B, which shows a two by two pi iota phi times B. What should be the U? What should we have U? Actually, over here, we are going to do what is called Hamiltonian encoding. Encoding. So we are going to encode the matrix, A matrix that we have onto the unitary, onto the exponent that is minus iota. Sorry. In this case, we won't have minus uh, A times T which is equal to u. So when we take u equal to uh, a times iota times t, uh, what happens is that we can, uh, we, we will be able to get the solutions. Uh, we will be applying this onto the b vector and b vector, you know, it can be written in terms of u basis. That is the eigenvector basis of a. So it will be bj and uj that we had already like defined earlier to n minus one. So we are going to apply u this u on this, which is nothing but uh, applying u on a particular value of j, right? So what happens when we solve this? How can we solve this? It's pretty simple. Uh, you have e to the power at using the Taylor series expansion. If you use that, what you're going to get is infinite n equal to zero to infinity at to the power n by n factorial. So I'm just going to expand this. Like I'll put plug in this over here. So we'll be getting something like this uh, sigma n equal to zero to infinity a t times n by n factorial uh, times b j u j. Okay, so I'll just expand this series, uh, which first term would be a to the power zero by zero factorial plus a to the power t by one factorial a t times two factorial Plus and so on up to infinity. And we have bj and uj. Now, uh, since we know that uj is the eigenvector of uh, a, so if we put, if we bring this uj inside the bracket and multiply with all the a's, what you're going to get is uh, eigenvalue lambda, uh, lambda j times uj. So it will somewhat, it will look like this now. Uh, uj since this is zero this is one there is no a there is a only one time so we'll get one lambda eigenvalue over here when you multiply it uh, okay times t is already there so the t is the scalar quantity upon one factor plus uh, we'll multiply it a two times so we'll get eigenvalue twice. So we are going to get over here lambda j square t square by two factorial times uj and so on up to infinity. Right. So we bring the uj's outside and what we are going to get is one plus lambda j t by one factorial plus lambda j t square by two factorial plus and so on bj uj. Okay, so this this thing over here is also the Taylor series expansion of e to the power iota theta. So now we can just write it as e to the power iota lambda j t uh, lambda j t is e, uh, times b j u j. So basically, when we are so basically, what we get is applying u on b will give us summation over e to the power iota lambda j t uh, bj uj this particular state 
now but we had earlier defined that u when applied to b would give us uh, summation e to the power iota 2 pi iota some phase phi so times bj uh, uj so basically we have over here find found the phase of e phase of b uh, phase of the eigen value of the b and now we are going to equate it so e to the power 2 pi iota phi is equal to e to the power iota lambda j let is for the j term right so we can just equate and we will get phi j as lambda j t by 2 pi okay so we had so we can plug in this part into our into our state that we have after applying all the first step basically that those first step together are called qp quantum phase estimation so this is ancilla over here and we had n phi and we had a b state when we just plug in this inside over phi what we are going to get is a times n uh, lambda j t by 2 pi and b over here okay so now we don't have control over n n is just the number of clock qubits that we have lambda is the eigen value and 2 pi is a constant we don't have control but this is the parameter t that we can control right so what if we choose the value of t such that this whole becomes an integer so let's say n lambda j also oh, lambda j times t by 2 pi is equal to some lambda j tilde so this lambda j tilde is an integer based on what value we choose uh, this t to be so we choose the value of t basically we choose t such that this whole term lambda j t by 2 pi or which can be written as lambda tilde j becomes an integer right so now our problem is solved uh, we have used our free parameter so that we can have an integer over here so finally so finally after applying the first part of the qubit we get this ancilla and lambda j tilde times uh, some b vector so i haven't expanded the b vector i'll just write the b vector in the expanded term or eigen uh, eigen value eigen vector basis u which is ui so this is a mm, bj uj and uh, lambda j tilde okay so j is equal to from 0 to n minus 1 now if you see carefully uh, what we we had initially proven that x vector is some is is given by a inverse b vector right and this can be further written as lambda inverse j bj uj right this was the solution this is what we want to have but what we have over here is not lambda we have a lambda vector so we want so the next step is to perform control rotation on ancilla qubit so that we can bring a, a lambda j inverse over here right so that will allow us to reach to this particular state so so we are just missing this thing right so we have to apply some control for that we need to apply some control rotations uh on y on an, on the ancilla qubit so we are going to perform it in such a way that we are able to get the is trans, transformed into a state 1 minus c square by lambda j square tilde we are using lambda tilde uh state 0 plus c by lambda j 
tilde state one, right? So based on the value of lambda j, so for whatever j we are working with, we'll have this state. So we are we are going to perform uh, rotations, and these rotations will be controlled. So the control will be on the basis of the uh, lambda value that we have over here, right? So if you just write it, we can just write it in a very simple, uh, like in a new form, which is bj, uj. Uh, we have lambda j over here, and we also have now ancilla, which has been, which we have applied uh, on which we have applied multiple control rotations. So uh, what we are going to write over here is one minus c square by lambda. Uh, j square tilde square state zero plus uh, lambda j tilde one. Right. Okay. So why did we do this? Uh, first of all, what is c? What is c? Uh, c is just a constant, and it's on us to choose. And also, c must be smaller than uh lambda j not being big so small but it should be smaller than lambda j tilde right so so what happens if that lambda j is smaller than so basically the normalizations normalization remains we are able to norm we get a normalized state over here also uh after applying rotations on the ancilla qubit these qubits you perform a measurement only on this part so on performing the measurement what you're going to get is that this state is going to collapse either into state 0 or state 1 so based on which state it collapses to uh, let's say if it collapses to state 1 then what we are going to have you're going to have a new state which will be n uh, j equal to zero to n minus one b j uh, u j lambda j tilde and it has collapsed to one so we are going to get c by lambda j tilde over here and one ancillary cube now if you see carefully when it has collapsed to the zero uh, sorry state one the ancillary bit has collapsed to state one upon measurement uh, we have we are able to get lambda j a scalar quantity the coefficient and we can just write it like this to get something which we are familiar with or which is our target lambda tilde bj uj lambda j tilde so this part of the circuit is now x so finally we have got x right but there is one more trouble uh, this x, this vector is entangled with this uh, clock register, which we do not want. Basically, when they are entangled, what will happen is that upon the measurement, this state of this state of the clock register, we are going to uh, spoil the state of this as well. So we won't be able to get the complete vector that we want. We'll get a particular state of the vector that which we do not want. We we, we want the complete vector, complete solution. So will next step would be to perform the inverse of uh, our first step, that is inverse of QP. So also before that, uh, we uh, we have to choose the value of C. So let this was the case when we got uh, when the ancilla qubit collapsed to state one. But what happens if it collapsed to zero? Then we are going to get this coefficient instead of C by lambda, which uh, we do not want, right? So what we do is restart with the with the whole algorithm until we are able to get a one state upon measurement uh, in the ancilla qubit, right? So in order to increase the probability of getting one, we have this c, right? So so if we choose the value of c such that c by lambda j is higher, very high, than under square under root of one minus c square by lambda j square. Then we'll have more probability of getting one, and we won't need to repeat our 
sir uh, repeat the execution of the circuit so that is the reason why we have this c and how do we implement this uh, kind of rotation or this kind of superposition that we have done is using the simple ry gate so ry gate is given by it has a parameter theta and it is given as uh, cos theta sin theta minus sin theta and cos theta so so basically we had insula insula qubit in zero state which is nothing but uh, this state so let's say we multiply it with this what we are going to get is c theta uh, is cos theta state zero and then sorry there will be minus over here there will be plus sin theta theta one so we have got this state this state now we have got this particular state so what we need is that sin theta must be equal to c by lambda j tilde so theta j so theta j is basically equal to sin inverse c by lambda j tilde so this will allow us to select the value of theta or, para or parameterized r by gate so that we are able to get uh, this put the insular qubit in this state okay so if uh, we have uh, theta sin theta is equal to c by lambda then cos theta will automatically become uh, j is equal to 1 minus sorry sin square theta j right so it will nothing it will give you square root of 1 minus c by lambda tilde j square and square so automatically it will become this once we choose theta to be c by lambda and as i told c can be any constant it depends on us to what to choose so what we have got is uh, insula sorry we don't have insula anymore we have operated rotations on it so what we have got is summation uh, lambda j tilde inverse and bj uj and this uh, this was lambda j tilde right It's vector j equal to 0 to n minus 1 but uh, we have insula over here so insula is unentangled with every each of them it is entangled but uh, it's kind of only state one so we know what state it is in but in lambda j case we do not know what state we are going to get and it is entangled with our x vector so we want to remove this entanglement between these two so in order to unentangle what we are going to do is apply our third step which is inverse of qpe right so how are we going to do that so in qp we had applied first hadamard then phase kickbacks multiple phase kickbacks and then uh, inverse quantum fourier transfer so we'll just do the reverse thing in the qp inverse just the mirror of that so we'll first apply inverse of inverse quantum fourier transform which is just the quantum fourier transform and then we'll apply phase kickbacks now in phase kickbacks we had apply u to the power e to the power u as at in this case u will be uh, inverse of this minus iota at and then third we apply the hadamard gates right so this should give us uh, our solution okay so what happens when we do this uh we have this state lambda uh, lambda j inverse uh, bj and then you have uj's and lambda tilde j right and one insula so i'll just uh, since we are operating these all these on this register clock register which is in certain state lambda j right now so i'll just uh, pull this out and uh, 
solve this separately, solve for this separately. That is lambda j tilde. And we are going to apply quantum phase estimation inverse. Right. So first thing was to apply in on inverse quantum Fourier transform is the QFT. So we all know uh, when we apply QFT to some number J, we are going to get one by N root N summation over K equal to zero to uh, N minus one e to the power two pi iota uh, J K by N and K over here. Okay. So in this case, what we are going to get in the first part that we are applying QFT, lambda J will transform to this state under root of e to k equal to zero to n minus one e to the power two pi iota k by n uh, times this sorry. There will be two pi iota will be here and there will be lambda tilde j lambda tilde followed by k by n okay then uh, k state right now we have to apply phase kickbacks right phase kickbacks with u is equal to this time the inverse of at okay so we know what happens when we apply phase kickback in general what happens so we are going to apply phase kickback on this part of this this is a scalar part so nothing will happen to this so it will remain as it is from k equal to zero to n minus one e to the power two pi iota lambda j tilde k by n and then uh you're applying u on k that is this part this thing so what you're going to get is summation over let's say y equal to zero to n minus one e to the power two pi iota uh, we were supposed to get phi in this case right i think uh, it was it was huh, minus sorry not this we are going to get lambda j minus iota lambda j t times y and y over here okay so uh, we'll just use some this will be tilde we'll just use some uh, formula not the formula but the uh, the relationships to cancel out these things so we can write uh, we know that lambda tilde is actually equal to uh, n times uh, was n times lambda j t by 2 pi okay so we'll just replace uh, lambda uh, this lambda j with this over there so what we are going to get is uh, exponent term with iota n lambda j and okay sorry this is going to be lambda right we are going we haven't uh, we made the substitution earlier uh, sorry after uh, we had applied the unitary operation right now we are applying so we'll be working with lambda over here so we'll be having lambda so we'll replace uh, uh, we can replace this as this with this part so what we are going to get basically uh, we can write lambda j as 2 pi lambda j tilde by t right so nt right so what we are going to get over here is uh, 2 pi lambda j tilde by tn and times t and y t t will cancel out and finally you are left to minus iota 2 pi lambda j tilde y by n and this part will be lambda so over here we what we have done let, let me speak all 
Okay. So uh, in face kickbacks, what we did is uh, we applied. Uh, we had only applied uh, lambda in our in this case we had applied lambdas, right? Lambda tildes, and the, here we are going to apply reverse of that. We are going to work with lambda lambda j's, and over here we will be working with we are getting lambda tilde. So in this part we work with lambda j's. Right, so sorry, not tilde, lambda j. So we do the reverse thing. So if you see, uh, sorry, this will also be y. So this would become y when we do the summation. I think this is some problem. Let's see, there's some problem with this. Okay, so basically the end goal is that this these two terms using the previous relationship should cancel each other out. So it let's so assuming that they cancel each other out. So what we are left with is upon opening this k equal to zero to uh, n minus one e to the power minus uh, sorry two pi iota. Uh, lambda j tilde y by n and e to the power minus two pi uh, two pi iota lambda j tilde y by n times y. So this cancels out with this, and we are left with one, and we have y. So in the end, what we get is summation over k equal to zero to n minus one. Which gives us uh, basically n minus one, so n number of y's again. So which cancels out with root n to give us root n, right? And uh, we can put this uh, back to our normal solution that we had over here. Uh, this state, this part of the state, and what we are going to get is. We will be getting something like this. Some normalization constant has to be there because we had uh, Acha forgot that uh, since we have performed the measurement on the ancilla qubit due to after performing the rotation, there will be certain normalization constant as well, which I'll denote by let's say uh, gamma. So this is just a normalization constant. So there's nothing to be like to go into that. It's just a coefficient. Uh, and have no use right now. So over here we have the new state after applying the inverse, uh, sorry, after applying quantum Fourier transform, the normalization constant times sigma j equal to zero to n minus one bj c by lambda j tilde and uj and sigma y equal to zero to n minus one till y and we have ancilla separately. So if you see uh, next step after applying uh, QFT and phase kickbacks in inverse direction, what we are going to do is apply Hadamard's onto that log register. So we know that uh, when we have a state zero and we apply Hadamard, what we are going to get is uh, just a superposition of two states, one and zero and one, which in summation notation, you can just write it as some k, k equal to zero to two to the power, uh, it will be uh, one minus one. Basically one, since we have one bit, we have one over here. So similarly, when we apply it on two state, we are going to get somewhat, uh, not somewhat, this state exactly. So two minus k, two minus one. And similarly, when we have n number of Hadamard, sorry, n number of qubits, and we apply Hadamard to all of them, we are going to get this new state to the power n minus one. Okay, so this is a more general form of the of applying Hadamard to the n bits altogether, right? 
now let's say uh, so if you see we have this particular state finally right this is the state that we have and we are going to apply hadamard and this state is similar same exactly the same as this particular state right over here so these two states are same it's just that they have one has k and one has one is denoted by y right what happens to so we are going to apply hadamard to this state right to that particular state and which is correspond like which is same as this state so it's like if you are applying hadamard in this direction you are going to get this if you are applying hadamard on this state that is in the backward direction you are going to get back these zero zeros states so so basically you are applying hadamard to this you are going to get zeros so so finally we know that when you apply hadamard to this clock register what we are going to get is a set of qubits which is in zero zero states so our final state would look like somewhat would look like uh so finally it would uh, be looking like some 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 gamma normalization constant j equal to 0 to n minus 1 bj c by lambda j lambda tilde j times uj and you have 0 0 which after applying qp which is a clock register and this one in so if you just uh, ignore c or bring c over here multiplied with gamma so c times gamma summation j equal to 0 to n minus 1 bj bring this up uh, lambda j lambda tilde j inverse uj and we tensor it with 0 0 dot dot clock register and tensor it with the ancilla register right so this is nothing but our x vector right so finally when you perform the measurement after performing all the steps and the inverse also inverse qp you perform the measurement on uh, measurement on your uh, state register right state register so so measurement performing the measurement on the state register will give you the x vector so this x vector is our solution to the set of linear equation that we want to solve uh, basically is the solution to this a inverse b d vectors right so i'll draw the final circuit what it actually looks like like uh, a complete that will give a complete picture okay so the complete circuit we have first one ancilla bit we have n number of clock registers c c and up to c and then we have the state b and uh, we apply the hadamard gates on all the part the clock register okay and uh, there's nothing with b and ancilla also there's nothing so after applying the Hadamard gate on B, we are going to perform control rotation U. This is the first qubit. So we're going to apply two to the power n minus one times. And this is the second last qubit. So we are going to apply it, apply U, two to the power one time. And this is the last one. So we are going to apply it two to the power zero time. So yes so u is basically e to the power a t a over here in this case in this case and this is uh 
Okay, I'll label it later. After that, uh, what we perform is the quantum in uh, Fourier transform, inverse quantum Fourier transform on the clock register, right? IQ. And beyond that, we are going to perform rotations on Encilla, which is our third, which was our third step. So rotations will be using RY gate and it will be controlled because each of the clock register will have its own lambda j. So it will be controlled on, there will be some control that we need to perform that will give us the required ancilla uh, superposition that we wanted for the ancilla gate. RY, so these, these RY have certain parameters theta j right so we can write it as dot dot and then over here some dot dot and nothing to this side and yes we need to measure perform measurement and perform measurement uh, if it gives us zero state we need to repeat repeat everything we will repeat everything that is there we'll start with uh, the beginning but if it is one continue then we are going to continue okay so then there comes the third part this third part i'll just uh, write it like earlier i written at the inverse of this so over here, you are going to perform a quantum Fourier transform, which is inverse of inverse quantum Fourier transform, right? Okay. Then uh, followed by this, we are going to perform control rotations. Now this will start with the first one, u to the power two zero. Then, uh, okay, I'll just draw it next. Uh, u to the power 2 to the power 1 and u to the power 2 to the power n minus 1. So I'll just draw the dotted lines over here. Okay. In this case, u is equal to u to the power minus iota. At right, so it's the it's just the reverse of what we have taken over here, which is e to the power iota t. Since we are performing the inverse of everything, and then the last thing to do is perform Hadamard operation on all the ancilla bits. Right, and after that, uh, what we do is perform measurement. After this is done, we just perform measurement on this. Clock, uh, sorry, our state register. So it is bound to give us X. This will give us X. So this is, uh, which is nothing but summation over, okay, sorry. Summation over uh, some C, some gamma constant, uh, normalization constant C and our uh, BJ, lambda J inverse. Uh, uj right so this is what we are going to get if we measure this and we measure if we measure this part for measurement on this part of the circle and just draw it completely we are going to get uh, zeros zeros and when you perform measurement on this or like you have continued the measurement so you are always going to have a state one over here So like if the algorithm, you have, if anyone has implemented the algorithm, this is a correct way to state, but check whether it has correctly been implemented or not. You must get a, a state one in the end over here. And these two registers must be, a clock register must be in zero, zero state. And if you know this, if you're sure that these are like, this is what you get on measurement, you can be sure that you will be getting X over here. So this is a, this actually is a very big circuit. So I'll just fit it in the screen. Okay, so 
together this is the circuit of our hhl algorithm Okay. This is the final circuit that we get. Now, one thing that it must be noted that although HHL algorithm gives us HHL algorithm gives uh, us exact solution, it is not a algorithm that you can easily perform on a noisy device. Not uh, basically, so it has been classified as one of the uh, long term. Algorithm. So long term meaning that in future, when we have uh, uh, commercializable, uh, scalable, sorry, scalable quantum computer in future, when we have the scalable uh, QCs, quantum computers, then we can use HHL algorithm to solve any set of linear equation. But right now, we have a NISC noisy, we are in the noisy era, right? So it is not possible to get the exact X vector using uh, your HHL algorithm because there will be errors and there will be, uh, uh, sorry, it will be not exact. So why not exact? Because since the quantum computers are prone to, are, uh, prone to errors, in the middle, there will be obviously there will be some flipping of the bit might take place unnecessarily due to noise outside noise in the quantum computers. So there are high chances that whatever you get over here will not be an a, like accurate solution. So you are not going to get exactly X, but you you might get an approximated X, or maybe not at all X. You might not even get X if the error is too high. Also, uh, one thing we must note that this is very big circuit. You have to implement QFT, you have to implement uh, rotations, and you have to implement multiple Hadamards. So this actually becomes uh, quite huge for a quantum computer or what do you call it? Uh, for a noisy quantum computer to actually be able to implement this, right? So we can say that Although HHL algorithm gives us a good solution, gives us the exact solution, but it is not, not suitable for NISC. Yeah, but yes, when you have matrix with matrices that you want to solve, let's say A, AX equal to B is what you want to solve, and A is just a four by four, one minus one, one, one. So in that case, yeah, you will be able to get a good, since it is very, it will give you a very small circuit of five qubits only, right? This is a five qubit and you have the B state. So this, this will be a very small circuit and it, yes, you can implement this. This will have a very less noise and less number of gates. But as you increase the size of matrix A, Basically, when you are increasing the size of A, what you are increasing is the number of equations that you want to solve. So minus one, minus one, minus one, 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 minus one, minus one, one, somewhat, somewhat equation, equations like this. So X, Y, Z. So this will require you one ancilla. And since you have three equations, you have, you will need three clock register three qubits in the clock register and B state that we that we'll have to prepare. So okay. So as you increase the size of the matrix or the number of uh, equations that you want to solve, the uh, the size of the circuit increases and therefore the noise that is there will also increase and which will give you a more uh, worse results, right? <laughs> Uh, you are not going to get a better results on increase in the solution size. But uh, once we have, uh, uh, like if we have the 
what do you call it? If we have the scalable, uh, scalable quantum computers, so you know that linear algebra or the solvent set of linear equation has applications in everywhere, everywhere. So once we have this uh, linear uh, system, so once we have this uh, scalable quantum computers, this HHL algorithm will actually be fruitful to various fields. For example, uh, when you are doing numerical simulations of various systems, uh, let's say uh, uh, thermal uh, heat flow through a metal metallic bar. So in numerical simulation, you are using, you're going to use a simulation. You're going to use a finite difference method like if you know about that, this is one method to solve, uh, numerically solve the differential equations, set of differential equations that you have through some physics model or some mathematical model. So finite difference method. method. So this, in this case, you get, uh, you have a differential equation that you want to solve and you create a grid. So you want to solve, you get a relation like, let's say this is X1, X2, X3. So you have certain relation like XI is equal to XI plus one uh, plus two. So there will be multiple relation. So there will be this relation, one this relation and one in this direction, which will, and one in this direction. So basically you can uh, merge these together, club these equations or relations together in a form of matrix uh, or linear equations. And then you can solve uh, that linear set of linear equations to get your uh, final value at each point. So once, so basically in numerical simulations, there will be to, in order to have a higher resolution, you need thousands of, more than thousands of grid points. These grid points are very large. Therefore, these uh, matrices also that you need to solve are very large and therefore we say that the linear, uh, numerical simulations sometimes need a large number of data uh, system of memory having a very large memory so for example uh, it took i think two to three supercomputers to put together the image of black holes right so if we have scalable quantum computers we can use this hhl algorithm to faster to make the process of solving these linear equations faster and that too exponentially, right? And not only uh, numerical simulation, then we have, uh, apart from numerical simulation, we have uh, machine learning, which has lots of linear algebra, where some somewhere or the other, you, it will find its applications. Uh, finance is there, like, Finance is there, and also uh, we know quantum mechanics is based on linear equations. So, simulation of quantum mechanical systems will also be one application. The system, right? So, these were a few examples that we have, uh, like not the example, but the applications of uh, HHL algorithm, what it holds in the future. So, basically at the end of this. Uh, so we can say that uh, the final takeaway is that HHL is able to solve linear equation, linear set of equations. Okay. And uh, it is only workable if you have scalable uh, QCs. And yes, exponential, and it will give a exponential shall speed up. Right. So yes, and uh, during the tutorial we solved how how it works. Okay. So this is a final takeaway. So I think I'll end over here. If there are any questions, uh, I'll be ready to answer.
थैंक यू रोहित पार्टिसिपेंट एनी क्वेश्चन एनी क्वेरीज so we have just uh, he has talked about the hl hsl algorithm and he has talked about the concept and the applications of the hsl algorithm participants if you have any queries please ask so thank you rohit uh, like it's quite interesting that we it is applicable to the finance and the machine learning problems like for the computer science people like it is useful for the machine learning applications and the finance applications so uh, thank you <laughs> thank you very much um, for coming and deliver the lecture here like it's my pleasure to do that so <laughs> it's a pleasure to us also <laughs> okay okay well, then. thank you thank uh, you welcome so participants also thank you very much the next session will be at tomorrow 10 o'clock